Good evening. I would like to call the regular Board of Education meeting um, for November to order. Ms. Hibb, would you call the roll, please? Mrs. Felter. Present. Mrs. Martin. Here. Mr. McCune. Here. Mr. Parker. Here. Mr. Poland. Here. Mr. Shear. Here. Dr. Daniels. Here. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> I understand that we have some guests this evening. Um, we have some future teachers from Mid-America Nazarene. Would you like to rise so we can welcome you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll try to make it really exciting for you. Who <laughs> <laughs> laughed? OK. We will uh, move right into our information and presentations. And it uh, looks like we should have Mr. Kendall coming forward. Is that correct? <clears throat> Mr. Kendall and accomplices. <laughs> yes. And I'll uh, introduce them in just a moment. But uh, in the past, I've come up and talked to you uh, about <coughs> American Education Week and it being a celebration of public education. I'm a real fan of public education. This year I want to really um, make my presentation based uh, a little bit more personally uh, about my belief in public education. Uh, I'm, I'm a product of public education. I'm the first uh, member of my family on either my mother or my father's side uh, to go to college. Uh, both my brother and I uh, ended up getting master's degrees. And this was made possible uh, because of our background with public education. Uh, my family uh, came from modest means. I mean, it, it's not an extraordinary American story by any means. It's a very, very typical American story. Uh, you know, just someone who, uh, you know, comes from a typical background is able to uh, get a good public education, uh, go on to college, and uh, eventually make a good life for myself. Well, that experience with public education uh, makes me a, a very strong believer in that process. And I know that Olathe is one of the strongest public education systems that I've ever been around or been exposed to. We have incredible diversity uh, in this district, as you all know. Uh, we have uh, some students who uh, come from, live in homes that uh, cost more than a million dollars. And we have some students who are homeless. Uh, we have some students whose parents have uh, graduate degrees. And we have some students whose parents do not speak English. And the Olathe Public Schools takes all of those students and provides them with an incredible foundation upon which they can build and they can do exactly the same thing that I did. Uh, tonight I have a couple of teachers from one of our Title I buildings, uh, Rolling Ridge, and they are going to uh, each uh, speak to you a little bit. I have uh, Katie Horner and Jane Musgrove. Good evening, I'm Katie Horner, and I teach Title Math at Rolling Ridge. And I'm Jane Musgrove, and I teach ELL at Rolling Ridge. November 18th through the 22nd, we observe American Education Week. This is a week that provides us the opportunity to think about the importance of American education and public education. Every day, over 4,000 staff of the Olathe School District come to work with a shared goal of working with over 29,000 students so they, can so they can achieve and receive a quality education. It's so much easier speaking to kids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. This is our first board meeting, by the way. Yeah. We're not used to board You can meetings. cut that out of the video. <laughs> <laughs> the kids will love that part. <laughs> but we do wish to honor 
um, not only the teachers and the administrators in our district, but also all the support people that come to work every day, including our paraeducators, our aides, our custodians, our nurses, uh, food production staff, uh, also our office staff, and all the others, all the, all the others that work together to ensure that our schools are inviting and safe place for education to occur and our children to learn. And we also want to thank the Board of Education for providing an environment where quality education does occur. So we are committed to our students and we believe that by working together that we can responsibly prepare our students for their future. And we invite you now to watch this short little video that we've prepared on American Education Week. Um, and it um, actually includes the students and teachers at Rolling Ridge. <laughs> this year's During this year's American Education Week, from November 18th through the 22nd, 2013, millions of educators, parents, students, and community leaders will join the National Education Association, NEA, in raising awareness about the critical need to provide every child with a quality public education. The theme this year is great public schools, a basic right, and our responsibility. The theme represents NEA's vision of calling upon all Americans to do their part in making public schools great for every child so they can grow and achieve in the 21st century. It's my responsibility to help children stay healthy. I am honored with the responsibility to make parents feel welcome. should be entertaining. <laughs> All right. Our second presentation this evening is about risk management and uh, <coughs> Hutchison will be doing the presentation. Good evening. We heard the uh, MNU students were going to be here, so we thought we'd really jazz up the evening with a conversation <laughs> on risk management. So, uh, risk management is a lot like fortune telling. You're expected to look into a crystal ball, see the future, and try to anticipate anything that could um, go wrong and adversely affect uh, the school district. But unlike fortune telling, uh, risk management isn't done with smoke and mirrors. It's done with very sound uh, practical uh, policies, procedures, and, and guidelines that we establish across our organization. Uh, it, if you look in uh, Wikipedia, they'll define risk management as risk management is identification, assessment, <coughs> prioritization of risks followed by coordinated and economical application of resources to minimize, monitor, control the probability and or impact, so on and so forth. Very long, complicated uh, statement there. Really, there's two words I want you to think about in that definition, and that's economical and minimize. Because risk management is really all about balance. You're trying to balance the amount of money you're willing to spend, the amount of bureaucracy you're willing to create, the amount of work that it's going to take against the level and comfort or of uh, risk you're willing to take on in any of our endeavors across the district. The way we uh, implement risk management in our organization is really uh, a full breadth uh, and depth across our district. All the um, functions that we perform and many of the uh, 
uh, departments in our district. Tonight, we're gonna talk about a few of those. We have uh, insurance coverages. We have the areas of business and finance, human resources, technology, administration, athletics, safety, security, and, and the list can go on. Communications department has uh, an effort there. Uh, uh, health and wellness has efforts there, but we're gonna focus on these tonight, except for safety and security. We're gonna save that for another presentation, I believe at the December board meeting, because it, it has uh, so much uh, information uh, in, in and of itself. Uh, before we get started, though, to uh, minimize the risk to my career, I better introduce everybody that's going to uh, take a part in this presentation. Uh, we'll have uh, Cassie Osborne, who is the controller for our district. Uh, we'll have Jim Payne, who's the executive director of Human Resources. Rita Lyon, executive director of Technology. Dr. Aaron Dugan, assistant superintendent. Uh, and Lane Green, who is our director of activities and athletics. Uh, we've also uh, minimized the risk of going over. We're going to put Lane last so that we can control <laughs> the amount of time he takes on the presentation. <laughs> the first area we want to talk about is business and finance because it is probably the most important area in, in the district. But the first point that I want to talk about is a new initiative that we're working uh, on called uh, contract inventory. Dr. Berry uh, asked if we could, um, in our area, develop an inventory of all the contracts across the district. Could we have a database of those? We have contracts that many of them the board sees. Many are very small that we may initiate in our offices or even at the school level. But we don't have one central place that tells us, hey, this one's coming due. And, and some of them are as simple as a 30-day a, a notice. Some takes uh, six months notice. Uh, uh, some of them may take 100 days just to get through our process before they come to you. So luckily, our new uh, financial software actually has a contract management module. And we're spending the year identifying and asking principals. Anytime you see anything that looks like a contract, which any of you, any of you uh, that are in business know, sometimes you're not sure if it's a contract or just a, a letter of intent or what it is. It's coming across my desk to determine, do we flag it for that inventory? Does it require our signature? Does it need board action? Should it be consolidated across the whole district? So we're doing that throughout the year to build the inventory and then we can uh, better assess that. I'm gonna turn it over to Cassie uh, at this point to go through the rest of business and finance. Business and finance, we are constantly assessing the risks of fraud, misstatement of financial information, as well as risk of regulatory noncompliance. <coughs> and the way we address this is through developing our processes and procedures, and those are based on a firm process of internal controls, which are intended to prevent and detect fraud, noncompliance, and misstatements. <coughs> Some examples of our <coughs> internal controls would be reconciliations, proper segregation of duties, um, analytical reviews of financial information, as well as approvals of transactions. One particular control that we have in place, and it's not necessarily an internal control because we have some outside help, is positive pay. And positive pay is a service that's actually offered to us and performed by our bank, our operating bank. And the way that positive pay works is that every time we process check payments to vendors and employees, we process a file of all of the check numbers that we've issued, and as well as the payee information and the check amounts for those checks, and we send that file to the bank. Then at the time that that actual check is presented at the bank for payment to clear on our account, they take the information that's on that actual check and compare it and verify it against the file. So this is a way for us to identify if we have any, um, any check tampering going on in our district. Um, another area that um, opens us up to quite a lot of risk, and I know that you as a board are aware of this risk because you've requested and received presentations on this in the past, is our purchasing cards. And um, just to highlight a few of the safeguards that we have in place around our purchasing cards. Um, first, um, purchasing cards are only issued to employees at the request and approval of an administrator. We require uh, detailed itemized receipts for every purchasing card transaction. Every transaction is approved and reviewed by an administrator. And we also perform in our accounting department a review each month of a selection of purchasing card transactions to make sure that everyone's following the purchasing card guidelines that we've communicated. Um, we're making sure that we have those detailed itemized receipts and then we're also making sure that all of the purchases that are being made are for appropriate school business. 
then to kind of tie up the discussion of uh, internal controls, I just wanted to mention that our internal controls are tested annually by an external independent audit firm as part of our normal annual financial statement audit. And while they don't offer or give an opinion on our internal controls, they do state in their reports whether or not they've noticed any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in our controls. So, you know, we're always being checked up on as those auditors come through. And again, those tests of controls that they perform, those allow them through their other auditing procedures to offer that opinion on our financial statements and whether or not they're fairly stated. And to wrap up the business and finance piece, I uh, just wanted to mention the assistance that we provide to parent organizations. And those would be PTAs, PTOs, booster clubs. Uh, we've put together a booklet of suggested guidelines and sort of best practices for those organizations to ad adopt. And those range anywhere from um, applying for a federal tax ID number to obtaining insurance coverage to implementing their own basic internal controls. And we also hold two meetings a year for these, the officers of these organizations where we discuss these best practices. Um, while these organizations are their own entities and are not um, affiliated, they're totally separate entities from the school district, um, we do feel like, we do recognize the important um, importance of their support that they provide to our schools and programs and we hope that this is a way of offering these suggested guidelines and best practices that they can then minimize their risks. <clears throat> and next up I'm turning it over to Jim Payne and Human <clears throat> Resources. Thanks very much. Um, just like everyone else we work uh, diligently to ensure safety well-being of our students and our staff while we're pursuing the vision and mission of the district. Um, you'll see up there a number of uh, areas where we work through uh, either our own department, departments uh, other than ours, and third-party vendors to work on risk management. Criminal background checks and fingerprints are good examples. We work with uh, diversity to provide criminal background checks. Um, not required by law, but we do require it, and it does a lot of good for us in terms of not only making sure that we hire people with minimal risks, but also just the very fact that employees, potential employees, know that we do this bars a lot of people from even applying because they know that we're going to take measures to ensure that only a, a person who has a clean criminal background is going to be with us. KBI, for part, we partner with them on fingerprint checks. Again, not required by law, but something that we do and uh, continue to, uh, to work on as we hire employees who meet certain criteria. The uh, documentation training, working uh, to uh, improve, doing a improved job of documenting interaction with employees, not only does this help us improve employee performance, but then in the case of a job action, places in a better situation to um, explain and defend whatever job action we take, making sure that we have paperwork in place and we've recorded the necessary things that need to be recorded so we can uh, be in a good situation in a hearing or an appeal. Uh, compliance training, uh, there are lots of areas in which we have to comply with various regulations. Uh, um, one, uh, one recent one that we trained on was uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, wages and hours, uh, trying to make sure that we don't run afoul of those rules and trying to make sure that we stay within uh, <clears throat> best practices so that uh, down the road we're not, um, we're in a good position to defend ourselves should there be some kind of uh, action claiming that we didn't follow a federal guideline. Uh, same with the Family Medical Leave Act or the Affordable Care Act or any number of things that we try to train on. Ethics training, I'd uh, say a special word here to two people, Scott Mason, who does a lot of that work with our new teachers and with our staff throughout the year, Denise Humphrey, who works this through our new teacher orientation, making sure that people are up to speed on a number of uh, expectations that we have of our employees, in part because the law has them of us, such as uh, uh, technology use uh, in, in and outside of the classroom, sexual harassment, uh, discrimination, uh, things like uh, uh, mandatory reporting, all of those, and I think you'll hear more about that in just a little bit, so that we know that our employees are aware of the expectations of them. I'd like to spend just a moment talking about third-party expertise. There's so many things out there that we're expected to do, and uh, we work with uh, CPI to make sure we're compliant in, in uh, the area of retirement uh, uh, 
planning, CBIS for a lot of our insurance benefits, uh, validity for criminal background checks. I'll highlight one, unemployment insurance services. You don't think about that necessarily as a risk management issue, but it certainly is. People in Employment Services work with us on claim management as well as representing us and helping us represent adequately ourselves in terms of, of uh, appeals so that we keep our costs down there and exposure to lawsuits as well. So that gives you a, a little quick overview of some of the things we do in HR. Well, certainly you hear a lot about technology in the news these days and we are not without our risks also. Um, we try to do everything possible to uh, keep ourselves safe and risk-free. Um, one of the things that we focus a lot on, and, and you have approved, thank thankfully, is a very robust and redundant backup system. Uh, we back up changes to every piece of data in the district every four hours, and a complete replication of that data <coughs> happens nightly. Uh, and it, it goes across the network. There's a, a replication of that here and one across the, um, across the side of the district at the West Dennis uh, Tech Support Center. We also have physical network security. And what I mean by that is multiple paths of network uh, redundancy in the district so that we have some failovers when we have a, a, an outage somewhere or a failure that we can switch the lines over to another segment of the network. Our server virtualization project that we have been working on for the last three or four years has really helped us in the ability to what we call a hot swap when you have a drive failure. In the olden days when you had a drive failure, a server went down, it was just down until you were able to get some hardware in here to replace that. Now when something like that happens, we can hot swap a drive. Um, people out in the district don't even know that something has failed behind the scenes. We also do as much power redundancy as we can to keep systems up and running when we have a brownout or when we have a short uh, power flash. The new um, tech support center that we're very excited about um, will provide us with a very storm resistant network operations center that we have not had at all in the district. So we're, you've probably watched it go up over there. The first thing that went up was the concrete block with lots of steel in it. Um, that's where the actual hardware of the network will sit in that um, facility. Uh, we will be able to bring some internet redundancy in, so we'll have two lines of internet going at all times for any failure that we might have. We also will have an improved cooling uh, generator over there to keep things up and running for a length of time that will at least allow us, if we have a major power failure for a long period of time, um, to bring things down in a normal fashion so we don't have uh, loss of data or anything like that. And then we will also, um, when we move over into that building, we will have the what is now the West Dennis Knox Center as what we call a warm disaster recovery. In other words, that will be a backup center, which we have not had that up to this point. So we're very excited as we move into this new uh, technology support center to have a lot of safety and, and redundancy that we haven't had. There's a lot of things that we do on the network to protect us from hackers and intrusions. Uh, we have a lot of appliances that sit there and just monitor things that are going on, any possible intrusion from the outside, anybody on the inside that's trying to send things out in large masses that they shouldn't be. Um, there's lots of different appliances that are sitting there, web filters that are filtering our, our web content for inappropriate, any inappropriate content so students can't get to that kind of thing. We also segment our wireless network um, so that the, the majority of our wireless network is running our district-owned devices, but we have now opened up the Bring Your Own Device Network, and that is segmented so that we don't have any uh, bleed over of uh, viruses and things like that on our wireless network. There's also a, 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 a software that we use, that security information management system, that really brings all of our appliances and all of our data together that we're searching for intrusions and possible detections of bad things going on out there brings that all together into a report that we monitor um, daily. We also have, if you've um, been over to our Network Operations Center, 
uh, screens going all the time that shows the network topography, uh, all of the switches and routers, the wireless access points, the servers. So we're monitoring that also physically uh, in the actual physical view to make sure that um, things are up and running. We see a red light, we know that we've got a problem right away. The, the takeaway here is that we really have a lot of devices and appliances that tell us um, that we've got any kind of rogue traffic going on and it really allows us to to look at that data on a daily basis, but we also have a, a network security team that meets on a monthly basis to review anything that we find suspicions that we need to upgrade, that we need to take a, a harder look at. Um, maybe we need to upgrade or maybe you know we need to do things differently. <clears throat> um, the endpoint security, excuse me, let me advance this. The point security that we're talking about here is the ability for us to protect all of our end devices with antivirus uh, malware protection. We're all concerned about viruses that are going around. That appliance that does that updates every five minutes. It's getting new information from the web every five minutes of possible viruses that are out there. That's protecting all of our endpoint devices. It's also protecting all of our servers, our switches, our routers, and those kinds of things. We have multi-layered access control, um, <coughs> uh, password protection. Our password is, is an eight-character password, has to have a capital letter in it, has to have a number in it. So it's a pretty high secure password. It expires every 30 days. We kind of take that from what the auditors suggest. So, you know, we're following those rules and practices that are out there. The patch management that we're talking about here, probably not of great interest to all of you, but every now and then you'll probably boot up your machine at home and you'll notice a little message down in the bottom corner that says you've got an update that needs to be applied. We have lots of those updates coming through, not only on our end devices, uh, the desktops and laptops, but servers and switches and routers and all kinds of things. We monitor for those patches all the time. We make sure that they're safe patches to put on. Sometimes we don't want to put those on right now. It might, it, it might affect us in a negative way. So somebody's monitoring that all the time to make sure that you know, we're doing the right thing, that we're, we're getting things patched and in the right place. Um, that we just are constantly looking at things like that. The one thing that I kind of want to leave you with as I was working through all of this with my network team, um, I, one of them wrote me back a little comment that I, I thought was appropriate and I wanted to read it to you. Security doesn't only come from the expensive black box sitting in a room somewhere. Security comes from the continuous conversations we have with each other. Because we are able to effectively communicate in technology with each other, we have made the attempts to address the issues and get ahead of the game as much as possible. So I think that's a good point to make from our team. Sure. It was a perfect segue for this conversation because on an annual basis we uh, come before you and, and discuss our insurances. Obviously we have property and liability insurance and we have workers comp. I just wanted to make a few points about workers comp this evening that we don't usually drill down to uh, and, and uh, Rita's comments are, are so appropriate to this. Um, workers comp, we're self-insured so we take on a greater risk or the board does uh, on our behalf. Uh, it, but we so we do things to help mitigate that risk first of all we purchase excess workers comp insurance so um, we, we kind of balance that risk uh, we take on the first four hundred thousand dollars of, of, of a major um, incident or an or event and then after that that insurance kicks in so we've got we've kind of balanced that um, that the economics and the risk again but uh, with regards to communications um, there's a lot of things that happen in that workers comp realm. First of all, we do we have a, work, a return to work program. We try to get people back uh, to work as quick as they can, but obviously they, they have to go through their healing process if they were hurt. Uh, if maybe a doctor would release, uh, you can't lift over 20 pounds, but you happen to be a warehouse worker. We might uh, loan them out to food production uh, and so that they can get back to the district and back to work as quick as possible. And then we have a variety of um, communication and, and uh, uh, practices uh, for training around the district. Uh, we have building uh, safety inspections. We inspe uh, there's a fall and spring inspection. The fall inspection at every building, lead custodian uh, has steps that they go through. Uh, in the spring, it's the safety rep for the building. And then every three years, uh, there's a full team that comes and inspects a building. Uh, we have um, 
uh, district safety committee. It's about 12 to 13 people from various areas in the district. Uh, they, they come together um, and this is in review the data. What are we doing wrong? What could we improve? How can we get better and better and better? Uh, building safety reps, uh, those uh, reps in each building are appointed by an uh, administrator to each building. They have an annual in-service that uh, it, it doesn't sound like it would be <laughs> exciting, but Denise Carpenter does a wonderful job to make it entertaining, informational, and, and, and engaging. So they come together and train once a year. And, anywhere, and, and beyond that, even there's a monthly Hints from Hilda. It's just a, a newsletter just reminding some of the most basic things uh, that we all know but don't always practice. Don't put the chair on the table to hang something. Call maintenance to have them hang something. So those constant reminders and communications just to keep it in the forefront. Uh, similar to comments from Human Resources and both John and Rita, probably the best way we manage risk management or one of the most <coughs> important is really in our people the quality people that are just doing the right things out in our buildings. Additionally to that, we provide them some resource, some guidelines, things that help them make some of those critical decisions. The code of conduct is, is one of those, and these are just not an inclusive list, but some examples. Our code of conduct provides guidelines and direction, unexpected behavior of students, and if that expected behavior doesn't happen, what are the consequences and options our administrators have? That helps us manage our risk in, to, in terms of student discipline. Um, bullying prevention, again, we have put out as a district numerous awareness activities, uh, trainings, documentation, reporting guidelines, um, monitoring devices, um, watching this and being careful with this and providing those leaders and staff in our buildings um, with the information they need to really manage an issue like bullying. Um, our general counsel, another great example of it, just a, a vital resource, uh, Mike Norris uh, provides for us great training, uh, sends us articles, keeps us up to speed on issues related to bullying prevention, documenting concerns, harassment issues. Um, he's been before our administrative staff numerous times talking about freedom of speech issues. When a student makes a threat away from school and on a computer using social media, what's the school's responsibility and what's our risk if we take on something that isn't school related? And so those kind of ongoing just counsel from Mike Norris is, is invaluable. Um, and similar to that, and we get it face to face with Scott Mason, our in-house counsel. Um, that's a busy guy working with us face to face and problem solving custodial issues. Uh, how do we share records among school districts and parents? Um, how do we do that and follow the law and the regulations um, and still be a friendly school district that's trying to help families uh, and students? A couple more quick examples. I mentioned student records. Um, drug and alcohol prevention. Um, we're helping kids. We're managing risk of, of um, that bleeding over into our school environment. And again, our code of conduct assists assist us with how we'll provide consequences, but we do training and awareness and we're bringing our community along with us in understanding the risks of uh, drug and alcohol. Uh, student records, and then as John mentioned, we're gonna talk about safety and security measures <coughs> next week, but from risk management, just to get the, the, the breadth of, from the design of buildings to the construction materials we use in buildings, to the protocols we use in critical incidents, to how we communicate as a large district um, about safety and security um, are all pieces of our risk management. Risk management is a huge part of athletics and activities for, for our athletic personnel. As we know, we have students <coughs> participating in 22 <coughs> sports and cheerleading, and some of those sports are collision sports, and, and uh, we transport students to those activities very often. And it's very, very important that we have a, a keen eye on risk management and athletics. The main thing I want to focus on is the, the training aspect, your last bullet, because we have our athletic directors, our high school athletic directors, three of them, including myself, have taken 12 hours of training in risk management and the legal responsibilities and duties of athletics personnel. And they go back to their schools and they pass those things on. We have our last athletic director is gonna be taking those courses this December. These courses uh, cover everything, like I said, from the legal duties of athletics personnel to hazing, which is a big issue right now, and harassment, Title IX, Fair and Labor Standards Act, event security, and quite a few other uh, issues in the legal realm and risk management realm 
that, that affect our athletic programs. Additionally, I conduct classes, our annual summer's conference, on the uh, risk management and the legal duties of coaches. And a lot of our coaches are great people, but they come in with a background in the X's and O's, but they don't really come in with a background of what are those things they really need to keep a key eye on supervision of our athletes, safe transportation, all those type things. And so I conduct in-service on that every year at our summer conference. The National Federation of High Schools has a curriculum where a coach can become a nationally certified interscholastic coach. And virtually every coach in our district has two of the four courses required for that already out of the way because last year we started requiring that all of our coaches take training in concussion management which is one of the courses which is a free course another free course heat acclimatization and heat illness and and so the <laughs> training the education of our coaches and athletic directors very very important part of our risk management program one of the duties we have is to evaluate the physical readiness of our athletes to participate in high school activities and athletics. As you all know, we do the pre-participation physicals for our athletes. Uh, we, it's on a voluntary basis, but as you know, a couple years ago, we started impact testing uh, to help with the management of concussions in our district. And just last spring, for the very first time, it's a voluntary program, $29 for about a $500 test. Parents can help the, have their kids go out their heart imaging to help detect undetected heart conditions that may exist in their athletes. So physical readiness of our athletes is very important. Safe playing environments, checklists, inspections, all those things we do. But something new that we're doing now that we put the synthetic turf fields in is something called GMAX testing, which is listed as one of the bullets. GMAX testancy is basically a test of shock absorbency of our athletic playing surfaces, outdoor surfaces. And basically what it is is a specialized piece of equipment, looks like a tripod, that drops, they call it a hammer, but it's a 20 pound, it looks like a bowling ball down onto the ground, there's sensors in that ball, and it gives data and feedback on how compacted that surface is. And it basically tells you, uh, it's an annual test it, it, that helps us make our athletic playing surfaces, there's a problem with one of them, we can do, our operations and maintenance staff can do remedial actions to try to make that part of the field safer and softer for our athletes. When this test happens, it happens at about, about 27 points around the field. And so that's something new that we're doing along with all the other things in, in our athletic facilities. And last, you know, athletic personnel districts have a really important duty to disclose uh, insurance disclosure to, to their athletes. You know, some districts don't even provide insurance for athletes that may be injured in competition. Uh, you go into the parent meeting, they give you a form where you can sign up and you pay yourself for optional insurance. We don't have to do this because through student assurance, we have an insurance policy. It's a secondary policy for our athletes. And of course, Keisha had a, has a catastrophic insurance policy. And that's why that pre-participation physical is so important because if a kid doesn't have that and they walk out and practice, and God forbid if there's some type of catastrophic injury, they would not have the benefit of that $5 million lifetime benefit. So the case of catastrophic insurance policy, the end game that I'm talking about here for athletics is that we provide a safe, positive, and educationally sound athletic program for our athletes. And risk management, you know, athletic directors do more than hire coaches and make sure we have enough Skittles in the concession stand before the game. That, that, that this is very, very important part of our role as athletic administrators as a whole risk management area. And John, I hope I didn't go too long. Did I do all right? Okay, good. As you can see, risk management is much more than just uh, providing insurance coverage. Uh, and it, it virtually touches every aspect of what we do each and every day. And it takes a lot of people to keep it in the forefront. We presented a lot to you this evening, so we definitely uh, stand for any questions or clarifications you might have. Questions, board members, comments? I just, Cassie said that they have uh, periodic meetings about the uh, purchase card processes. I guess just like to have an example of some of the maybe some of the issues that we prevented or caught or uh, you know um, from some of those meetings I, I can indicate one right off the top of my head uh, detailed receipt 
you might have a receipt, but that didn't detail behind it. And we, uh, you, by regulation, you really need the detailed one. So uh, that's one of the things we watch for in the audit. Um, make sure no sales tax was charged. So those are the types of things. And um, it's it's not a punitive thing. We're really um, sit down with the principal and, and bookkeeper or secretary <coughs> and try and walk through these pieces and explain why it's important. And and we've had a great reception to when Cassie goes out and does that. I, I can say I stood behind a teacher the other day at a store who was trying to use their purchasing card and getting the salesperson to take that sales tax off was was quite a process. So I can imagine that it's cha it's a challenge to do that. Mm -hmm. And then just a quick question for Reed on the, uh, is the West Dennis Center ever going to be upgraded to the NOC standards over here? If that's the desire of the board. <laughs> <laughs> is that something that uh, has been under consideration? You, you know, I, I think if, if you had the money to do that at some point in time, that would be something that you would want to look at. We're just thrilled to have the facility that is going up next door. Right. So we're, this is a huge, huge step just to get this for. John, just a quick question. Naturally bring all these great people here and the thought that comes to my mind is we serve how many kids lunch, meals every day? Are we gonna hear something about food production? Uh, I guess that would be the will of the board if they would like a update on that. I know it's been a couple years I think since uh, Scott Kingery has come and kind of presented. We'd be open to that. I don't know we need a presentation, but I just, you know, like I said, I apologize for the one person you didn't bring here today to ask a question about that. <laughs> That's a huge uh, risk factor to us, too. I'm done. Other questions or comments? Thank you for a very thorough presentation. Yep. Appreciate it. It looks to me like we have about four minutes. So I propose we move on to our action consent agenda. That would be items 5.01 through 5.07. We have had that information provided to us in prior board meetings and I would um, accept a motion to approve the agenda or the, the <coughs> items or pull them out if you need to sure i would move to approve the uh, consent agenda consent agenda items 5.01 through 5.07 second <coughs> sorry it was amy yeah thank, thank you. you i have a motion by mr McCune and a second by ms martin to approve the consent agenda items Ms. Hibbs? Mrs. Felter? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Um, let's move on then and try to do a few of these action items, bids, contracts, and agreements. The first one is item 6.01, the digital folder to replace outdated equipment for graphic communications. I'd move to accept the low bid from Stars Equipment Company for $26,895 less trade-in allowance of $1,900 for a total purchase price of $24,995. Second. A motion by Mr. Poland and a second by Ms. Felter to approve a purchase of the digital folder by, for graphic communications. Ms. Hibbs? Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. I'll move on to 6.02 for the Technology Support Center electrical easement. <clears throat> I move to grant KCPNL an electrical easement to the Technology Support Center. Second. Was that Mr. Poland? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have a motion by uh, Mr. Shear and a second by Ms. Poland to grant KCPNL an electrical easement to the Technology Support Center. Ms. Hibbs? Mr. McCune? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Can we get one more in? Yeah. All right. We are on a roll. Item 6.03 is the computer bid. 
Can we get a little information about that? that that's why I don't know if we'll get this one in or not. Right. Do we want to try or do we want to wait? Let's try. Time? Okay. We got I just, three minutes. Just, if you just kind of give us a little background, I mean, it's great the fact that the uh, budget amount was 3.9 and we're able to get it for two. So kind of talk through that a little bit and then also the uh, rejection of the very lowest bid just to kind of update us a bit, please. The 3.9 also included laptops, which we have not bid yet. Um, we are actually waiting on a new chip that's supposed to be out on the market this month that um, is. Um, really supposed to the extend the battery life of laptops uh, a lot and so we're really anxious to, to get our hands on that chip so we've delayed the laptop portion of this bid so that money was all kind of tied together so this is kind of the desktop piece of our our computer replacement bid so that's why you see a higher amount there than than what we're actually bringing forth so when the, when the laptop comes in will it be the full difference here or, or are we still under well, on I hope bid? I hope it won't be the full difference because okay. we got some very good pricing on these desktops this time uh, they came in uh, lower than we anticipated which we're always thrilled when that happens um, when we put the budget together, we kind of have to go on what we anticipate the retail price is because you never know when the when they bid them what they're going to bid them at. So we budget off the retail price and then um, always hope, of course, for lower bids. So that's okay. that's where that difference is there with those, those amounts. Just in, in, for good clarification, then in, in this a budget amount, we don't have to do it tonight. But if we took out the budgeted amount, are you able to estimate what the laptops are so that we could have a clean? bid versus what the dollar amount is for here and then what we'll do it for the laptops i can actually okay. actually get you that amount and we we're we're still working through the um, the, the quantity of how much we're going to need and then as we're waiting on this chip to see what kind of pricing that's going to bring the laptop in at it's a very good okay. because that'll help me because I, I won't be as excited as i was to see it one point nine <laughs> <laughs> the difference here I was yeah excited about that. sorry that was just okay. a little bit misleading is that it uh, and the low bid, uh, you just kind of talk through why we didn't select. Yeah, the they didn't. Bid. They didn't meet the specs of the <clears throat> installation and the services that we require for the vendor to provide um, moving forward. They they actually wanted to image all of those <coughs> desktops on site in South Dakota and not here, and that was not acceptable. Good. Very good. All right, I would entertain a motion then. Well, I move to accept the computer bid from Technology Group Solutions, LLC, in the amount of $2,020,637.40. 20, Second. Whoa. That's not there. <laughs> All right, I'm going with a motion by Mr. Shear and a second by Mr. Poland to accept. No. No? <laughs> no? no. no. He wasn't. Holy crow. Okay. Mr. McCune. Mr. McCune, sorry about that. <laughs> to accept the computer bid from Technology Group Solutions, Ms. Hib Mr. Parker. Yes. Mr. Poland. Yes. Mr. Shear. Yes. Dr. Daniels. Yes. Mrs. Felter. Yes. Mrs. Martin. Yes. Mr. McCune. Yes. All right. We will adjourn now until 7 o'clock for our comfort break and then come back and do recognitions and awards and public comment. Thank you for coming back together, and uh, it is now time for our recognition and awards. Mr. Poland's looking very spiffy this evening. Good evening. We have numerous recognitions tonight. I'd like to welcome all of our distinguished guests. We're going to begin our recognitions tonight with a business partner that is very near and dear to our hearts, the Olathe Public Schools Foundation. I'd like to ask Heather Schoonover from Community Development to come forward to help with this recognition. Founded in 1997, the mission of the foundation is to provide grants, scholarships, and recognitions for the teachers and students of our district. Under their leadership, Olathe staff have been awarded the Educator Excellence Award as well as the Classified Staff Outstanding Service Award. Since 1998, students have been receiving scholarships, Wimmer Care Fund support in times of need, and the All Fund Dollars for Avid Lifetime Learners. The foundation annually fills backpacks with supplies for students in need at the back to school outreach and for school specific requests. Exciting community events that support education have been the Families Read Every Day program as well as the Rachel's Challenge. 
Through special events such as the annual breakfast or golf tournament, as well as the state and community donations, the foundation continues to raise the bar in funding support to the Olathe Public Schools. More than $563,000 was donated to district programs during the 2012-2013 school year. It is our honor to express our appreciation for all of their support. I'd like to ask the following to come forward. Executive Director Cindy Von Felt, Foundation President Brian Hamilton, Board Members Mike Major, Kaylin Kendall, Charlene Hughes, Dave Reinke, Darren Odom, and of course Rick Shear and Marlon Berry who are representatives on the Foundation Board. Thank you for all you do for our schools. Thank you very much. Next, we will recognize two students who have achieved a great feat. Six Olathe Public School students have achieved a perfect score in the ACT this past year, and tonight we are recognizing two of those students. Nationally, while the actual number of students earning a composite score of 36 varies from year to year, less than one-tenth of one percent of students taking the ACT earn this top score. I'd like to ask the following students to come forward along with their administrator. Evan Eshelman from Olathe South along with Assistant Principal Denise Herman and Eric Flam from Olathe Northwest with Assistant Principal Jay Novacek. Congratulations to each of you. And I know your families are here tonight. We'd love for them to stand and be recognized as well. Congratulations. Next, we'd like to recognize Megan Kyle, Olathe North High School senior. Megan, if you could come forward along with Principal David Morford and Band Director Justin Love. Megan was selected to be a member of the 2014 U.S. Army All-American Marching Band. She will join an elite group of musicians who will perform during halftime of the U.S. Army All-American Bowl in San Antonio, Texas. Megan plays clarinet and was a member of the 2013 Kansas All-State Band and is a featured soloist with the Olathe North Screamin' Eagle Marching Band. The U.S. Army All-American Marching Band recognizes the top 125 high school senior marching musicians and color guard members from across the country. She is the third student in a row to be selected from Olathe North to be in this elite band. Congratulations, Megan. And I know your family is here as well. We'd love for them to stand and be recognized. Thank you. Our final recognition tonight is of Audrey Judd from Olathe Northwest High School. Audrey, if you could come forward, along with Assistant Principal and Athletic Director Jay Novacek. Audrey won the Kansas State Championship in Girls Golf at the Buffalo Dunes Golf Course in Garden City, Kansas. This is her second individual state championship in a row in Girls Golf. She hit a one under par and scored 71. She topped the second place finisher by three strokes. Congratulations. And Audrey, we'd love for your family to stand and be recognized as well. <laughs> Congratulations. And that concludes our recognitions tonight. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. <clears throat> It's now time for uh, public comments. At each regular meeting, the Board of Education reserves limited time for individuals wishing to address the board. We request that individual speakers limit their comments to five minutes. The clerk will monitor the time and notify the speaker when the five-minute time limit has expired. Please direct your comments to the entire board. 
If a response is appropriate, the president will respond or refer to another individual. In an effort to respect the privacy, we ask that speakers refrain from discussing personal complaints involving individual staff members or students. Those speaking are advised that public comments are videotape recorded for broadcast on the district's educational access channel and audio tape recorded as a matter of public record. Individuals addressing the board should come to the podium at the front of the room and state your name and address. Uh, we do have one individual who has asked to address the board, Jennifer Cole. <clears throat> Good evening, my name is Jennifer Cole. I'm, my address is 13108 King, Overland Park, Kansas. Um, I have two issues to address the board today. First of all, November is National Adoption Month. Um, I'm an adoptive parent of, of two older children and would like to encourage anyone that is out there thinking of adoption to greatly consider it. There are thousands and thousands of children on the waiting list. My daughters were adopted at age three and eight and I would encourage everyone to take a look at that. Um, as an adoptive parent, I also would like to address the school board in an issue that comes up every year and causes emotional distress to my children as well as many other children that I have um, in my adoption support groups. It is a baby guessing game that happens a lot, whether it's in elementary school through uh, secondary education. A lot of these children <laughs> do not have fond memories of their youngers or many families don't have those infantile pictures. It causes social asterization for the children who do not have those pictures and just causes a lot of distress. So if there, it seems to be an antiquated system. The Olathe School District seems to be very progressive in many of their teaching styles. I'd like to address that that maybe be under consideration uh, to be looked at in the curriculum changes and development needs. Secondly, I come as an orchestra parent and booster. Uh, many of you, I know some of the few um, board members that are new, we had an issue in regards to band uniforms. I'm coming to address orchestra uniforms. Uh, the orchestra student program is large. I believe it provides many publicities just uh, for the um, school district as much as athletics. Uh, at a recent event at Olathe East, there was over 400 children provi providing strings concerts, and they were all in uniforms that they had to purchase or provide by themselves. Um, I'd like to see the board take a look at the 2014 budget and see if there are room for um, secondary or middle school uniforms that could be provided to the orchestra students. Um, like I said, band uniforms are provided, and especially in the secondary situation, I believe. Those, Latha East, for example, is, going, is the only high school to be invited for a state concert, and all those children will be providing clothes that they have to provide by their own families. So there may be children that cannot um, provide that and can't participate in those events because it's basically a pay for playing. So I want to raise that attention to you and I thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Dr. Barry, I'll ask you to address those and maybe in forward communication to us at a later point. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the board at this time? <clears throat> if so, come forward. Seeing no one, then we will move on to our other action items. Uh, 7.01 is the 2013 Kansas Association of School Board Delegate Assembly Appointment. So we have to do two motions this evening. The first is um, to nominate and then cease nominations, and then the second is to appoint a delegate. I believe Mr. Shear volunteered. Yes. Would that be correct? Anyone else <laughs> jumping to, to fight him for this honor? <laughs> Good luck, Rick. You also need a del an alternate. Yes, delegate. we do. And that's going to be you. <coughs> I, I would be willing to do that, but if there's someone else who plans to be at the convention that would really like to, it's all theirs. Would you like me to make a motion? I would like that very much. 
I move to appoint Rick Shear as delegate and Amy Martin as alternate delegate to represent the Olathe. Cease. And then we have to uh, cease. We have to cease. Okay, let me back up. <laughs> okay, I motion to cease nominations. How's Second. that? Okay, that was Mr. Poland. Yes, that was. All right. <laughs> I have a motion by Ms. Felter and a second by Mr. Poland to cease nominations for the KASB Delegate Assembly appointment. Ms. Hibbs? Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. Poland? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Felter? <coughs> yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Now, Ms. Felter. Thank you. I move yet again to appoint Rick and Amy, delegate and alternate delegate, to represent the Olathe Public Schools at the December 8, 2013 Kansas Association of School Boards Delegate Assembly. Second. Thank you. Okay. I have a motion by Ms. Felter and a second by Mr. McCune to appoint Rick Shear as delegate and Amy Martin as alternate delegate to represent Olathe Schools at the KSB Delegate Assembly. Ms. Hibbs? Mr. Polin? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. We are at this point of the agenda, <clears throat> excuse me, future action items 8.01 through 8.014. I know that we will be having a presentation on 8. Uh, 14 so is there any discussion on any of the items prior to that just share that that's your place you should have a copy of the audit so we, we get that to you ahead of time uh, but staff member will be here uh, from the firm next time to make comments to you as a board and, and stand for questions and the immunization uh, 8.13 the changes to that are not super significant, right? Shortens the window for us a little bit. Any other questions about any of those items or comments? <clears throat> if not, then I believe um, Dr. Dugan is presenting this evening. Thank you. <laughs> Again, her presentation tonight uh, is going to detail the work of the Boundary Committee. Uh, and again, we brought this to you a month ahead of time with the presentation so that we have a, a month to consider that and, and uh, look after any more information. But we would be looking for action at our December meeting. Good evening again. Um, I bring to you, as Dr. Irby mentioned, actually kind of two future action items uh, combined in one, the first being the uh, recommendation from district staff with uh, Millbrook Elementary's boundary attendance areas, and the second being something that's more of a smaller cosmetic type change, meaning there's no direct impact on students um, for a new apartment complex not yet built in the Bentwood Elementary attendance area. Um, let's start with Millbrook, though. There it is. It's real. It's uh, looking a whole lot uh, like a school, and we're, we're very uh, uh, excited about that. Um, as you're aware, we have a long established boundary change process in this district, and I'll walk you through a little bit what we in fact did, um, uh, as we've done each time. Um, and then also in 2005, a, a brilliant school board really laid out, uh, someone's laughing that was on it, really laid out guiding principles that really have uh, since then steered the direction and this decision making process for us. Uh, let me first kind of give a shout out. I had a chance uh, since August to work with three really amazing school communities. Um, the Ravenwood School Community, uh, Forest View and Meadow Lane, um, and took them through this process. And I'll walk you really briefly through the process that started um, in early August. Um, and as this board knows and past boards and many folks in our community, the boundary change process is an emotional process. Uh, here's the good news. People love the schools they're at. They love their principal. They love that second grade teacher. Um, and that's great news for a growing high quality school district. We love that you love your school. So it makes it painful and it makes it challenging. We then have to go into some really solid communities that we have throughout this district and say, gosh, we need to make a change. 
uh, we're growing, we need to adjust accordingly. These three communities, as communities in the past, they listened, they were engaged and participated, they had good questions, um, they shared the challenges, they shared the emotions, um, but with me they came along in reviewing data with our, our districts uh, boundary study group, um, and they, they understood the situation and the challenges um, and really helped us um, in the recommendation we bring forth today. So a huge shout out to them. Very briefly, I mentioned we started back in August. Uh, we met with the site councils from all three communities. Um, and then we did something a little different as we took recommendations of uh, parents from all the neighborhoods <coughs> that potentially could be impact by Millbrook and we met twice, two different weeks for a number of hours, what we called a work session. We brought them data, they asked us to bring them more data, we drew maps, they had blank pieces of paper. We really engaged them. There's about 42 folks uh, from these different communities that were part of that process with us. Um, I thought it was very successful. We got great input. We've made much of our recommendation based on their very thoughtful questions and input. Um, we then took it out to the community. So we then went to each of the three impacted communities, spent some time reviewing much of what I'll review with you tonight, and we sat and we asked for their input and we wrote it all down and we put the questions up on the web. And, and again, and then tonight we're doing a future action item. And again, you'll come back in a month, uh, we hope, and then take some action on the recommendation I'm bringing you. Uh, another piece, we've been incredibly transparent, and that's been the way this district handles uh, boundary adjustments uh, for years, and that this isn't a secret process and it's not been predetermined. Um, and as information was presented, we put that PowerPoint up on the web for all to see, and if you asked a question, we typed it up and we answered it and we put it on the web, and you could tell your neighbors about it, you could see if we answered the question you submitted on an index card. So again, this is part of the way we do business in Olathe to really make this um, a community process. So let me start with some of the data. So we started, of course, a number of years ago anticipating um, elementary um, uh, 35 uh, and also looking and following enrollment data as we do on a regular basis. So let me share a little bit if we were not going to provide enrollment relief to the three buildings and three school communities I mentioned, what we'd be looking at. So, and I'll kind of let you glance at that. But so our current enrollment, you'll see that for the three schools, uh, the next column you'll see a projection to 20, 2018. Um, and next to it, probably the important comparison then is that functional capacity. Okay, and that that's those areas where uh, that are appropriately sized, where programs should be um, in their appropriate instructional spaces. So that's what we consider our functional capacity. So for example, Forest View currently is at about 451 students. We project in 2018 they'd beat a little over 700 students, and we know their functional capacity is about 720. Okay, and then you'll see that also for Meadow Lane, and then also for Ravenwood, currently at 671 students, estimated by 2018 to reduce a little bit to 652, but most importantly, you'll notice they're already above their functional capacity for that building, which is 617. Just really quickly, these are the areas we're talking about, the Meadow Lane community, the Forest View community, and the Ravenwood community. I'll just have you note, and I think this is probably the best map because you don't have to see the detail, the density that is the Ravenwood community. Um, uh, it's, the, it's the smallest of these areas and it's packed. It's a very dense community with a school that's incredibly centrally located in a very dense uh, community, a lovely dense community. Let me walk you through a little bit the enrollment story uh, of these schools to, to see historically how we've gotten um, to this point. You'll see back in 2005 uh, for Ravenwood, the enrollment, and you'll see that continue uh, in, in this upward trend. You'll notice when we did the reconfiguration, there was a little bit of a drop because remember we pulled those sixth graders out for one of, the, one of the many reasons was to provide some enrollment relief at so many of our elementary schools. But then you'll see it picked right back up and continued to increase. And you'll see where it crossed over that red capacity line. It's the I'm full line, I'm way past full, this is my max capacity um, has crossed over that. Then we project that out to 2018, so folks say, okay, but what's it going to do moving forward? And you'll see at no point does it dip down past underneath its capacity. So what it told us and what it told the community and as we've visited in our work sessions, we have a school that's very full 
and for the projected future is not going to experience its own relief and so we're going to need to get in there and offer some enrollment relief. Let's do the same for Forest View. Again, a, a, certainly a newer school, and you'll see it has a very upward trend in terms of its enrollment, and yet a large gap between where it is currently and its capacity, that top red line. But sure enough, as we project out to 2018, that upward trend continues in a neighborhood that's continuing to develop and build out with lots and lots of new um, homes. And again, what we see is it right at its capacity um, by 2018. Again, so we knew this was a school we needed to watch. We needed to be all able to, <clears throat> through this elementary, offer some enrollment relief. And then also Meadow Lane. It's got a little rockier or bumpier <clears throat> kind of trend line here. Uh, you'll see that we did a boundary adjustment when we opened Woodland uh, because it was nearing its capacity. You'll see it dropped way down. So we, we in fact, did what we were hoping and reducing its enrollment. Um, and then it started to build back up. It decreased again. We pulled those sixth graders out for reconfiguration. And then it did just again, similar to those other schools, it has again continued to trend upward. And then if you play Meadow Lane out also to 2018, you see an enrollment that's continuing to rise and actually matching and meeting up with its capacity there at the building. Um, so there's some reassurances in, we have projected growth at these schools and we knew we had schools that were in need of enrollment relief. One of the questions that uh, came up and, and actually always comes up is this question, and I'm gonna paraphrase a community person that asked me that question. Gosh, does the board look at transfers? Because if you would just take the kids that are transferred in and move them back out, I bet you wouldn't need to relieve the enrollment at our school. Um, this sense that maybe there's hundreds of kids that shouldn't be there. Um, and so we always have been very transparent about providing that information. And it gets asked regularly enough, I thought it important to, to put in front of you guys here this evening. Um, and again, what you'll see, it's not large numbers. It is not the enrollment impact that folks sometimes think it is. Um, and you'll notice in most cases of Ravenwood, for example, the school we're talking about that currently is, is at such capacity. Um, this past year had 72 students transferring in, and it had 74 students that live in that Ravenwood area transferring out. Okay, so really a wash. In some situations, uh, Forest View, for instance, has more students out than in, and there's just various uh, and assorted reasons for that, but we follow board policy and approve those transfers uh, if they have unique or highly justifiable situations. So always like to put that up there. Uh, one, to kind of eliminate that as the fix for uh, schools that, have, uh, that are at high enrollment numbers. One of the other pieces we looked at, and of course we talked about these were growing communities, and our work session folks and our site council folks asked it, and Chris Grollop did a lovely job of talking about what's the future development around these areas, because one of the board's guiding principles to make adjustments is to say we want long-term solutions. We don't want to get in there and make some changes and then have growth pop up or development pop up that we weren't anticipating. And, and, and Chris does a lovely job of this and spent some time talking about, and they're built into his 2018 projections, what he projects the development is going to look like. If you look on there, you'll see it's color coded and you'll see the different areas. I think interesting to note, look around the Ravenwood area, and just as an example, okay? Ravenwood area is about built out. There's not much more development that's going to happen there. So now as we make a decision and get them to a comfortable enrollment level, we can be confident that they're not going to need another boundary adjustment. We can be almost very confident about that. Um, and so you can see that based on the development. What you can see if you look over in Forest View and then even just west of the elementary 35 or the Millbrook site, that brown, we, we anticipate lots of development going on in those areas, and we've had to plan accordingly, and you'll see that built into our projections. One of the things we looked at, too, with the work session, I always say this was kind of the highlight part of the work session, because this is when it got hard. So we had folks from these neighborhoods sitting down with us, looking at these numbers, and so what we put up here was, these are the different neighborhoods, and these are the number of students in these neighborhoods? Um, and how do we come up with a plan to move some students from their current schools uh, in order to um, have them uh, in, in Millbrook Elementary? And so this is one of the maps we use for part of that process. This is an interesting, and give me just a second or so to explain this. 
we actually had uh, our 40 person committee uh, working in groups of eight uh, with blank maps and then that map with the numbers by uh, community and we said draw the boundaries what, what makes sense what's intuitive here uh, to this to your concept of a neighborhood school to the neighborhoods and the numbers the darkest area on this grid is when we had complete consensus from all eight groups all the groups agreed in the darkest areas and I think it's a kind of a, a purplish color for Mr. Parker um, the, that was obvious to them that made sense that was intuitive and the numbers spoke to them on that and then as the areas get lighter the different colors we didn't have complete consensus on other neighborhoods to then uh, bring in and so we continued our conversations and we started then blending groups together and I want to walk you through three options um, that we're bringing to you tonight um, in terms of what we reviewed and then ultimately one recommendation here's option a in the area that is the Millbrook boundaries is the purple deep purple area I say it's kind of looks like the state of Nevada so that's kind of the area of focus as I describe uh, those boundaries a lot um, this is a kind of a straight northern boundary uh, up at the top there above elementary 35 um, it is taking Foxfield Village and Sunnybrook uh, from Meadow Lane they've typically attended Meadow Lane from the Ravenwood area this option takes Cedar Brook um, and uh, Hunters Creek estate subdivision and then Forest View, and you'll see this is uh, uh, consistent throughout these three options, that Forest View area between K7 and Lone Elm in the shape of a triangle is included every time as like a aha, of course, that is an area that would go to the new school. So it is the purplish uh, triangle. So we took this option and we ran the data. So I want to show you kind of similar to that early data, the data we ran looking if, this, if these were the boundaries what information does that provide us? So we looked at things like, uh, what's the 2014 opening the year that Millbrook would open? What would be the opening enrollment at all four of these schools now? And you'll see elementary, I mean, Millbrook, excuse me, at about 388. You'll see Forest View at about, um, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, 366. Forest View at 396, Meadow Lane at 391, Ravenwood at 537. Okay, so we started to look and say, is that enough relief at Ravenwood? Okay, and as we look all the way out, now go out to 2018, same schools, and look at how they are, those, those enrollment numbers relative to the, those capacity uh, numbers again. With Millbrook at, in 2018 having 414 students with a capacity of 700, Forest View at 559, Ravenwood at 500 with a capacity a little over 600. Let me share option B now as well, okay? So similar concept, here's the boundaries, and I'm gonna show you some data related to this. Option B, again, devised from our work session groups and, and, and again, thoughts from our district boundary study committee as well. This option takes more students from Meadow Lane and fewer students from Ravenwood. The northern boundaries extended north, it picks up Brighton's Landing, again, option A did not pick up the Brighton's Landing neighborhood, uh, in addition to Foxfield Village, both which currently feed um, Middle Lane as well as Sunnybrook and then in the Ravenwood area only that Cedar Brook neighborhood is moved from Ravenwood and then also 33 acres of vacant land that's immediately east of Ravenwood is also moved to Woodland in this scenario um, taking all of the underdeveloped land from the Ravenwood attendance area okay and again you'll see the Forest View K7 to Lone Elm Triangle remains in the Millbrook boundary area so let's look at option B in terms of the data and enrollment and projections compared to capacity again. What you notice in 2014 is Millbrook Elementary opens right at about 400 students, which is an awesome number, an awesome number. Flip down to Meadow Lane, also same year, 2014, drops to 335 students. And, and like we described with this option, it takes a pretty big cut into Meadow Lane and ultimately will tell you too big a cut into Meadow Lane and then if you look at Ravenwood it doesn't impact the enrollment at Ravenwood tremendously um, and in fact leaves it fairly high going out again to 2018 comparing those enrollment numbers to capacity again with Ravenwood at 543 in 2018 
with its capacity at 637. And here was the final option we considered. Bear with me as I describe this one a little bit to you. Um, this option changes the boundary with Meadow Lane some. It doesn't take the Brighton's Landing neighborhood, okay? But it does uh, take Sunnybrook still and Foxfield Village. Most importantly, it also picks up a piece of undeveloped land. You'll see like that purple near the, the top there has bumped out. Um, there's no current students there. It doesn't have a current enrollment decrease at Meadow Lane, but it does have the future potential uh, for growth at Millbrook as it develops. But there's no current students impacted in terms of that. And then you'll notice for the Ravenwood area in terms of neighborhoods coming out of there, takes a real straight cut down in terms of picking up uh, Cedar Brook, Hunters Creek, Hunters Creek Estates, um, and it leaves Hunters Creek Highlands in the Ravenwood Attendance area. And again, you'll see the Forest View uh, Triangle area uh, continued in this particular boundary option. And again, the data for this. And, and I'm gonna actually show you some specific points, but you'll see that in 2014, Millbrook would open with 395 students. We wanted something in the 400 range, and so uh, that feels good. And you'll notice for Ravenwood, going from 669 currently, a nice enrollment relief um, down to a little over 500. And then watching both the other schools, Forest View and Meadow Lane, especially as you come out to 2018, what you see, and which is most obvious in this graph compared to the previous, there's really a convergence of we have four schools that don't differ a lot in their enrollment and that also are maintained at a nice distance from that building's capacity. My segue to, of course, is our staff recommendation tonight as a future action item for the boundaries for Millbrook will be this option C. But let me walk through some of the input questions, concerns from our community as we kind of consider um, this and, and see what questions you guys have. These yellow arrows just arrows highlight some of the pieces I just ma uh, mentioned. Um, looking immediately at the opening of Millbrook, what, what's the enrollment going to be at all four buildings? Okay, at 2018, where will we be as we project out? What we know for at least three of these buildings, Millbrook, Meadow Lane, and Ravenwood, it is likely they're not gonna continue to get much bigger, that we can maintain all of those buildings with this capacity and not, and without an additional boundary change. Um, Forest Views, then we're gonna watch a little bit. It's likely that we can maintain it under its capacity, but it's one that we're gonna have to continue to monitor just with the vast amount of development out there. A point that, that needs to be made, and we, and we shared this with all the community groups, we're also able um, and, and think it's important that we will be maintaining the middle school feeder pattern. Okay, who does this impact? That impacts that previously going to Forest View and then on to Mission Trail, that triangle area. Um, east of K-7 to Lone Elm, they'll continue to go to Mission Trail, and that's as we look at projections for both Prairie Trail and Mission Trail. Uh, Mission Trail will have more capacity uh, for a while as both of those schools continue to increase in their enrollment. Um, and our feedback from the community on that was welcomed. It felt good maintaining that feeder pattern. Let me share some more of the community input and the questions and concerns and also bring to you one more option uh, based on this, at least that we considered. Um, there was great agreement, as I mentioned, in all of these neighborhoods and in these communities in our meetings that Ravenwood was in need of significant and immediate relief. Um, and that Forest View and Meadow Lane were going to need future relief and, and this needed to be addressed in this boundary. Uh, we provided often, and it was a, a source of great angst for some families, a clarification that, in fact, if their child was in their last year, their fifth grade year, at any of these elementary schools, they were most welcome to complete their elementary career uh, there. And even for that last year, if there were younger siblings that also wanted to stay for ease of transportation and just some continuity, um, that would be fine as well. Once that student would move up to middle school, the siblings would then need to readjust and, and attend um, uh, Millbrook. Um, so that was information we put out there and questions often asked. Um, the other question was, gosh, can we turn in for a parent-initiated transfer? 
uh, if we want to stay at our school and not follow the boundary and we assured them that in fact there was a board approved process that would exist for them and if they in fact had a unique or highly qualified uh, highly justifiable reason it would go through our approval process um, and so those were some of the clarifications and good questions we had input and we had concerns and questions concerning the walking distance um, specifically this is when comparing walking routes from those families and students that live in the Ravenwood attendance boundary currently compared to Millbrook um, and some of the information we've shared back and put on the web and we're certainly part of our consideration uh, Millbrook is closer for families that attended Meadow Lane or Forest View from uh, Foxfield Village from Grayson Place from that triangle area so for some of these impacted neighborhoods in fact Millbrook will be a closer school walking distance uh, for them uh, obviously <coughs> um, Stony Brook Foxfield Village Grayson Place for any of the homes currently in that Ravenwood we showed that really dense populated area with that school sitting fairly central on that one end Millbrook will be a farther distance for any student <coughs> living in the Ravenwood current boundaries um, and that's just a foundational piece of information um, some of the impacted neighborhoods within the recommended Millbrook boundaries will go from being 0.3 miles away so they're a third of a mile away from Ravenwood but now they'll be a mile to 1.2 miles uh, to Millbrook um, and again that was a concern raised from some families uh, and other families uh, that shared out loud how lucky they were to have a school a mile away uh, that that relative to the neighborhood school concept um, they were thrilled with that particular piece but from that also let me share um, one of the pieces here is what we're calling a walkable map um, and it was an option we looked at that said what would it look like if in fact we left any student that was a third of a mile from Ravenwood we left them in the Ravenwood attendance boundary okay and you'll see what now was it what was a straight line splitting the Ravenwood community is now a, a curvier um, line and and I'll read a little bit of the the description off to the side um, the subdivisions of Ravenwood Place Cedar Brook Hunters Creek would be split between Ravenwood and Millbrook in this option but it allows all students within a third of a mile of Ravenwood to continue going to Ravenwood This alternative option impacts 20 students, that there's about 20 students that live a third of a mile from Ravenwood. This boundary though would split three neighborhoods. Um, so literally st students that live across the street from each other, where the only thing separating their driveways is the street, would go to two different schools. And, and historically, uh, this board and this district has not chosen to split neighborhoods when it's uh, set up boundaries has not been a preferred option for <clears throat> splitting up neighborhoods we had questions and concerns and, and certainly received input about the unsafe walking conditions if you live in Cedar Brook and you come out onto Parker which then becomes Lone Elm which hit 119th it's a narrow road there's no sidewalks um, and just how unsafe that would be for those families and students to then walk um, to Millbrook we have and with the help of, of Chris um, there are walking routes out of Cedar Brook that would go straight across through Grayson Place through a subdivision along residential streets that have curbs and street lights lots of sidewalks not all the sidewalks are complete yet and as houses are finished then the sidewalk in front of the house gets developed this alternative walking routes about 500 feet further than if they had been able to just go straight up um, that Parker Lone Elm um, there's pieces of it that seem safer to us in general to be walking through residential with folks supervising and looking versus coming up what are the backyards of folks from Lone Elm Parker so it's a further distance by 500 feet but there are some safe walking routes from that Cedar Brook area probably where we heard the concerns about the walking distance um, to get to Millbrook and this is a map that's maybe more difficult to read um, so that same purple area is the boundaries the option C boundaries for Millbrook the light purple area are all those areas that are within a mile okay in our district typically students and families that live farther than a mile further than a mile from the school typically aren't walking to school anyway especially at an elementary level 
Okay, so our walkers are typically those that are within the mile radius and again feel like we have some good sidewalk options for them to make that safe transport to school. And again, we'd be looking at a pay for ride option for buses going into those neighborhoods that live further than the mile um, away from Millbrook. <coughs> <coughs> Another issue that was raised, and again, similar to the safe passage from these neighborhoods to Millbrook, um, was where are the crossing guards going to be? Where are the signals going to be? How am I going to get it from Cedarbrook across Parker to get into Grayson Place to come up? And then when I come out of Grayson Place, how am I going to cross over 119th Street? When I'm coming from Foxfield Village, it has great sidewalks. I'm still going to have to cross over 119th really twice. Um, and so what we were able to reassure, and as we've done every time we've built an elementary school, we'll work closely with the city of Olathe. Um, I don't know what those options will be yet, but we'll be talking about crosswalks. We'll be talking about cross guards. We'll be talking about crossing signals uh, with certainly a commitment. And the city has always been a great partner with, on, with us on this. We will make it safe for kids to cross both 119th and Parker Lone Elm. Um, I, I, we asked Chris to take a peek at this and how unusual is this, and he reminds us there are many schools when we open them where we had the similar concerns about safe passage, very busy roads. Uh, Arbor Creek's 159th crossing from Brome across 159th. Um, similar concerns, and in fact, crossing signals are in there, and there's a crosswalk now. Uh, Ridgeview, students that live east of Ridgeview, right across from the street, there's actually not sidewalks in that neighborhood, and they make safe passage across a very busy Ridgeview uh, road, if you're familiar with that area. Um, so we've encountered this before, and we've worked with the city, and I think we've put some really nice solutions in place. Um, it, it certainly is uh, incredibly important to us that kids get to school safely. It's exciting to open a new elementary school. Uh, we've done it a couple times in this district, 35. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm telling you, the excitement never goes away. And, and we had folks at every community meeting that were thrilled for the new elementary school and that they would get to go there. We were able to tell them that principal will be named in December. Uh, there'll be lots of opportunities starting in January to get to know that principal and also for that principal to get to know these communities that he or she will serve. And then the really fun stuff, they get to start to establish some of these uh, elementary school traditions to get kids really excited. Uh, what are the school colors gonna be? What's the school mascot gonna be? They'll start to set some culture uh, with students and parents and, and they got lots of folks excited. As I wrap up kind of the discussion about Millbrook and in terms of our recommendation tonight, we went back and, and I went back and the district study boundary went back to say, how are some of the decisions and recommendations <coughs> we're making tonight match up with those guiding principles um, that I shared the, the, the board in 2005? And let me just give a couple quick examples and certainly it's something you can review um, prior to our December decision. Uh, one of the things that, that we have so many needs to consider when we do this, students' academic safety, social, emotional. Um, we were uh, most excited about this option C recommendation that it, that it really allowed appropriate use of learning spaces and an appropriate capacity to have some flexibility to do things in appropriate learning spaces in all four of these schools. But we also recognize we're going to continue to, to need to work with the city to address this issue of safe passage, as we do every time we open an elementary school. In terms of enrollment numbers, we know that enrollment numbers have an impact on student learning, and we want those environments to enhance. Um, we felt confident about our recommendation because all of those recommendations and all of those schools would have enrollment numbers that were sitting below capacity but they weren't so below capacity that they were gonna impact some staffing. The nurse, the counselor, we, we made some adjustments that give them flexibility and appropriate learning spaces without impacting staff. And as you talk to staff and parents, um, it, really important issue. We were able to maintain middle school feeder patterns. Um, each school remains below capacity um, for the significant long term. Again, with Forest View being the one we're going to have to watch a little bit. But likely for three of those schools, we'll need to make no further boundary adjustments. Uh, and then in terms of fiscal responsibility, certainly not our, our number one concern as we made this, but Option C's recommendation would open Millbrook with 400 students. Uh, and that has budget implications for us, the number of students that we can open a new building with in its first and second year. Um, so we felt uh, good about that and also just the consistent enrollment numbers at the other schools. 
Let me really quickly do the next. I'm going to take questions from you guys. <coughs> This is, uh, I'm gonna show you the map first and then come back. So that pretty green area is an undeveloped apartment complex. It's not there yet, and as you can see, it is almost split down the middle between the Regency Place, a tenants <clears throat> area, and the Bentwood, a tenants area. Again, it's not developed yet, so there aren't any students there. It sits at about 135th and Rose Hill. Uh, it, it is planned for about 402 units and based on the style of these units, we honestly only anticipate about 20 students would come from that apartment complex. So the impact is about 20 students. When we looked at the capacity currently at Bentwood and its projected capacity, just comparing Bentwood to Regency Place, Regency Place is at 80% of its capacity. Bentwood's currently at 55% of its capacity. So it made sense to us uh, just, again, that this entire apartment complex, we would cosmetically move that boundary line so that those students would all attend uh, Bentwood. So our recommendation is to redraw that line starting in 2014-15, uh, not knowing when families will start, or that'll be fully developed, but we'll already have that on the map, and so there won't be those questions once we have students uh, living in some of those units. I have provided you a whole lot of information. And I am happy, again, lots for you to, to review uh, and ask questions tonight or over the month before we come back in December and ask that you take action on our recommendation. Thank you very much for this thorough report. Can you tell me on option C, the recommendation, does it impact Woodland's population at all? It does not. Okay. It does not. crossing of uh, the streets there being a concern to all parents. Uh, I can't recall, Dr. Berry keeps us updated on any time there's an issue. Have we had any incidents of, at crossings anywhere in the district? Uh, not, in my, uh, not in my recent history in terms of do we typically have very safe passage and we, we haven't had incidents with kids getting hit by cars or uh, some of those. Our partnership with the life is pretty darn good. You bet. Are we constantly vigilant about it? I, I mean, I almost hate to say that out loud, right. you know, be, uh, because I think it's a constant worry. Uh, Laverne, we send a lot of reminders to schools and remind kids how to cross the street. You know, we grew up and our parents taught us how to cross streets, and it seems to be a forgotten art. We have a lot of darting of young kids. So it's something I think we're, we're hyper vigilant about, but in fact, our track record's been great. And that really is thanks to the city. They, they don't want this either. Uh, they get as many calls as we would if there wasn't safe passage. Right. It's their streets, it's their sidewalks in many situations. Um, we've had great partnership with our crossing guards folks. I mean, stop and think about that. The number of schools, that, that's really an amazing statistic. <laughs> and we have some busy roads. I mean, we know how busy yeah. Olathe has yeah. gotten. We have kids crossing some high traffic areas very safely. Erin, can you remind me the layout of Ravenwood? I know they're over their functional capacity right now. Do they, do they have wet areas like some of our other schools? Have those They've been? had to be built out, They're so built great out. question. Okay. So in order, you know, it's like folks like, if you're over capacity, are kids like out on patios and hanging out windows? No, we take instructional space and we turn it into classrooms. So they no longer have wet areas. Those have been built into classrooms. And so when we provide this enrollment relief, they'll get back those activity areas. So the, the functional capacity of the building does not include the wet areas Correct. being fit out as classrooms? Correct. Okay. Correct. Because we anticipate that those should be used for what they were intended. Small groups to come out to work on projects, classes to group together in those activity areas for large and small group projects, peer tutoring happening. Ravenwood doesn't have the luxury to do that flexible grouping because we've taken that space and used it as classroom space. So they'll get that back, uh, which allows them to stay a good amount under capacity. Mm -hmm. Most of the kids hanging out windows are at our second story buildings uh, right. in the district usually. I, I wanted to make a quick comment. You know, she talked a lot about functional capacity and so forth, but it's also been uh, proven in our district that we operate best at 85% of our functional capacity. That allows that principal and that building to have the flexibility to move things, have a few spaces. And again, we're talking of regular classrooms. But so for Ravenwood, um, 617, the functional capacity, 524 kids. So w w again, that's ideal for us. But in a growing district, we've been well over capacity uh, at many times. 
I'll, I'll just jump on the Ravenwood piece and not talk about kids out of windows, but it's a similar piece. Um, Ravenwood's not been able to have uh, their community school carnival, okay, because it's too many. It becomes unsafe. They can't even fit them on their property or park them in that parking lot. And so even separate from the capacity and the number of classrooms, it impacts the community's ability to do some of those large school community back to school nights. They have to separate by grade levels and some of those pieces. And so that came up often, uh, especially at the Ravenwood community night, the need to get back some of that community feel because they'd gotten so large. I know that when my kids were in school, the part of the time the wet spaces were available to them and things just ran so much more smoothly. You know, classes could double up, get together in that wet space, or small groups could go out and use that wet space for a separate project. And, and as soon as schools lost that space, it became really challenging for teachers to kind of individualize instruction or to collaborate with each other. Right. And, and so and spaces just get tighter. So take a lot of kids and put them in tighter spaces. And they're not very these spaces. No. I'm sorry to say. No. no. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dugan, I'd just like to compliment you and your team on the way that uh, this boundary adjustment has been handled to this point in time. Uh, I, 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 I being that I lo have long lost track of how many boundary adjustments I've been through. <laughs> <laughs> And um, Dr. Daniels, for some of our board members, this is their probably a, this is their first one, and I can tell you that this is. Um, I haven't had a lot of communication with parent groups, and that's a sign that we are communicating with them, and we're open and we're transparent, and uh, there was no foregone conclusions here. And when did we open Forest View? 2009. 2009. Guess, so 2008, we had to make a decision on the boundaries for Forest View, which was giving relief to uh, Ravenwood as well as um, Cedar Creek. Cedar Creek, thank you. And that corner uh, that you referenced so many times, that was really, really a painful, difficult decision for the board at that time because we really they really needed to go to Ravenwood and we would like to have gone to Ravenwood but we we see what the numbers look like tonight and that was projected out what the position that we, we would have been in Ravenwood had we left that corner go to Ravenwood and I know those parents that live in that corner were really disappointed in that decision that we made because they've been crossing K7 yes for the last four years and obviously their children are not walking so and that night we made a commitment that we would build a school over there and so we're honoring that commitment some of those parents may or may not remember that their, their children are probably already gone and in 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 other either high school or middle school but um, it, it feels really good to be able to make that commitment to those parents and to the parents that are <coughs> further away to the north and to the east uh, just think about those parents who have crossed K-7 for the last five years. Um, I understand, and we appreciate and understand safety, and as Mr. Poland and as you reiterated earlier, we're very, very concerned about that. And in my 16, 15, 14 years on the board, we've never had an incident, serious incident, a few bumps and scrapes here and there, and obviously that's, we, that's, that's, that's tragic that we have those. But with the community, our school community, as well as our crossing guards, as well as the police department, uh, we do a really good job getting 20, 29,000 kids to and from school uh, nine months of the year. So I appreciate what, what was said about traffic and about crossing roads, and but we can manage that. We have in the past, we have kids going across 151st Street, 143rd, every, every 127th, every main thorough black bomb, every <laughs> main street in Olathe has kids crossing it going to school. <laughs> and we just we're not going to be able to avoid that what we have to do is we have to manage it and that's what we've always done in the past and I have all the confidence that we'll do that in the future a gentleman stood up at the Ravenwood community meeting and thanked this board he's been waiting patiently <laughs> from the triangle to yeah. attend <laughs> the new elementary school and he did have kids and so he was lovely and grateful and has been a, a, a raving fan of the districts and he came that night just yeah. To thanks. It's also testament to a great process that, that was established by you guys, but also a great decision that we were in need of 35 and the, and the foresight to approve that and to pick a location that really, for the most part, is ideal to offer this relief to the buildings. It, Dr. Dugan, one, a couple of things that I, questions I had. You bet. As you're showing all these um, <coughs> charts and, and you're showing the enrollment estimate, you know, we're, we're showing 
um, Millbrook, Forest View, Meadow Lane, and Ravenwood, but we're not showing numbers for Woodland. Is it possible to add those in? I mean, because all the all the pictures are showing Woodland. I've just been kind of curious about what the what the enrollment is, what the estimated enrollment is, and and how did because it didn't move a lot of things there. But it'd be since it does border it, I'd be interested in seeing some of those numbers and how they project out. Oh, great, and I'd be happy to get you. We actually looked at it work in the work session, so some of the community asked just that, right. um, and we talked a lot. Uh, probably a larger safety issue from moving any of these communities would be the ability to get to Woodland and crossing railroad tracks. Right. Some of those issues almost automatically remove it from the discussion in terms of historically what we've done, mm -hmm. but easily we provided that to the community when they asked for that data, so we can do that for sure. And then my second question, you on, on the one view, you talked about the feeders into the middle school. So is, is my understanding, just for clarification, so they're gonna be, some of the students that are gonna go to elementary 30, um, 35, some of them will go to one middle school and some of them will go to another middle school. So it's going to split when they get ready to go to sixth grade. It will. Right? And, and that's not dissimilar to other elementary schools that we have. Okay. The only area that will not go to Prairie Trail will be that triangle area that has previously been at Forest View and has made the happy transition to Mission Trail, although at the time caused great angst. Um, and, and my feedback thus far has been that feels good to them still by the middle school age and they get a bus and they head off to middle school. So all of the other area, all the other schools were already feeding Prairie Trail and so they'll continue to. It's just that triangle area that will stay with Mission Trail. So I, I, I take it then that we looked at those numbers and, and feeding into the middle schools by breaking that up is not going to overcrowd one or the other going either direction with that then or no I mean does it help to balance it they both are growing schools okay. and we're monitoring them really carefully it makes sense for Mission Trail to hang on to those students because it's got a little more capacity in future <clears throat> years than Prairie Trail will have okay. Uh, one more question, Dr. Dugan. I, I noticed in your presentation that, and I, I understand that there's a lot of development in this area, and some areas don't have sidewalks in them. In the past, we've made variances for to but to transport those students who are not over the two, who are within the two and a half miles, but because of safety concerns, was there any discussion about whether we would have a variance for any transportation for any of those students? It can still be a conversation we have. Our, our recommendation at this point is it's not needed. Okay. Um, th there's, as you, it, the walking kind of paths. And so if you're in Cedar Brook, which is kind of the largest concern, the, the walking routes, and we want to assign them well and have, again, safe passing, um, there aren't that many spots without sidewalks. So your sidewalk along in this house doesn't have one. And similar to when Manchester Park went in and that neighborhood built up around it, students walking there were walking through and there weren't sidewalks everywhere. So we still think it's a safe area and a safe walk. And again, we have a history of students walking while neighborhoods were growing. Um, and so at this point, we're not thinking we need to do a transportation variance where we send a bus in at no cost. Uh, certainly if you live farther, though, that you have the option farther than a mile to pay. Um, and many families throughout the district take us up on that option. I have a comment and uh, also a question. <clears throat> I was able to attend two of the three meetings. I thought it was great that um, the parents that were there very positive they asked great questions, and I felt like uh, they were answered. Um, that area is in my district. I've received two emails, uh, and they're both from the same person. I'm just asking questions mainly about the safety component of it. And I would just ask, uh, working with the city um, and the school district, when would we know or the parents know if it would be a crosswalk, crossing guards? Um, Certainly the, fir the first thing will be for us to take action and determine boundaries and then once we have those is to start sitting down with the city okay. and determine that they've been very responsive. Ideally we'd have lots of those answers this spring for families obviously so they can prepare, have some time this summer to walk the route uh, and some of those kind of things. So we'll get on it really quickly uh, in January with the city uh, following the December action from Perfect. the board. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. I'll wrap up comments then. Um, Dr. Dugan, I did attend all three of the boundary meetings and I just wanted to, to, to thank everyone, um, but specifically to thank you for running excellent meetings. I heard from parents at all three 
meetings, how much they appreciated the process, how much they appreciated you. So thank you for representing our district well. Great communities. I, I guess I wasn't one, wrapping. I just want to okay. yeah, just add on to what Dr. Daniel said is that, you know, uh, I, anybody that hasn't attended to these meetings, uh, you know, uh, I hope that sometime you will. Uh, not the fact that your kids gonna be transferred, <laughs> Can't do it. Uh, but uh, the process we go through is very good, and I guess I just want to commend our district. And I, I want to, I hope the people in our district are proud of the job we do because we take this very, very seriously. Uh, this is probably one of the toughest decisions we have uh, on the as a board member, and we take it very seriously. And I have friends that live in a surrounding district, and believe me, their experiences are not the same as as ours. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and they're not happy with the process. So our process is very good. We take it seriously. And I just express pride as a, as a board member the, with the job we do. So thanks for a job well done. All right. Um, in our board packets for, um, we have written information, item 9.01, Ted Start Director's monthly report. Any comments or questions? Moving on then, uh, we will have our board topics for discussion. And uh, we are going to spend a little bit of time talking about the legislative agenda for KASB, but I wanted to ask if there are other topics that we could address first quickly so that we have more time to uh, address KSB. Yes, If Beth. Dr. Uh, Barry could just give us an update on uh, Mill Creek. Or, uh, Mill, Mill Creek okay. in the center of where sure. we are when the board sure. might hear some uh, proposals. And we gave a, a brief update to the uh, construction committee the other day. <clears throat> but what we are doing currently is we are working with an architect to bring a master plan to you. We heard that very clearly from you that we want to get going on this project. Uh, we want to have a master plan so we know all the pieces as we uh, move forward. And so we anticipate having that shortly after the first of the year. Um, some exciting discussion about the uses for that building. Uh, again, located at Central Olathe that we think will be uh, very beneficial to us. So after the first of the year, at some point, we'll be bringing that to you. Great, thanks. Any other items for discussion? If not, then, uh, Mr. Shear, if you'd like to, and Ms. Martin, would <clears throat> like to give us some update on KSB legislative positions. And I believe you all have at your place printed information. Yeah, there should be two two different documents. One is the uh, 2014 legislative focus that we have talked about, and then the other one is the document from um, KSB and some of the recommendations for that. Um, so it's eight o'clock. So by nine o'clock, we should be done. <laughs> Um, no, it shouldn't take that long, but I wanted, wanted to bring to you um, the information that we've talked about. So you know that we, in September, we sat down as a group um, and we, we talked a little bit about the legislative direction that we we're going and then we formulated this 2014 legislative focus. We talked about um, some of the different things that the committee had been talking about. And as our group, we came back and, and we put this first document together. Um, with that, though, part of my responsibility of being on the legislative committee was to take the information that we look at and, and how we want to see the Olathe School District and, and working with um, the legislators and, and the teachers and things such as that. And then I have to take that to the legislative committee and then work with all the school districts across the state of Kansas. And that's the part that I want to talk mostly about is that in that collaborative effort, um, it is very, very interesting when you talk to all the other school districts, the um, vast difference in how they look at things and, and the needs in their individual districts um, and, and their wants in their individual, in individual districts. So what I wanted to talk to you about is what, what came out of that legislative committee. And again, keep in mind that this is not necessarily um, our own very own point of view and what we want, but this is a collective effort across the entire entire state because now KSB is going to take that to the legislators and say, okay, here's the position of KESB for the entire state. Um, and as I said, it was very interesting to see um, 
the differences in, in the um, districts across the state. A lot in the Western Kansas had some very, very strong opinions about things um, that I wasn't aware of that I got very well educated on. Um, so what I wanted to kind of walk us through, so you had the first document, and this is what we talked about because we were looking at it, and from our perspective, we said, you know, the, the way we have a lot of things right now, other than the two main facts of things that we really want to focus on from a legislative um, standpoint is, is funding. Okay, we as a, as a length of the district know that we really want to focus on that and the legislator to be able to support us from a funding standpoint. And the second one was the common core piece of it. Okay, and, and, and making sure that we as a district and they understood and hear from us that, that from the board's perspective, even from the teacher's perspective, that the common core, which is now the Kansas um, College and Career Ready Standards, is very important to us. And that's what we really wanted to focus on. When I get to the legislative committee meetings, though, however, and we had three of those um, very long committee meetings, um, very long days on the Saturdays, but um, while those two were very, very important across the entire state, there were other issues that, that uh, certain school districts wanted to talk about. And that's what I wanted to kind of cover tonight, just so you guys kind of hear this, because as the Olathe um, School District, as the delegate now, I'm going to have to go in December and, and cast a vote on these different on these different topics. There's going to be uh, six total motions um, that we will be casting votes on. And I want to make sure that we have a collective understanding here of what we're doing to go forward. Um, so I wanted to kind of start off just a little bit in the, and again, not to take up a lot of time, but I wanted to just read a couple of paragraphs in, in the document that came from the uh, legislative committee. Um, first off, this is the first in education. It's a comprehensive program for improving educational outcomes in Kansas by increasing the number of college and career ready students it is based on three guiding principles, raising educational standards, providing suitable finance for every child in the district, and strengthening local leadership. During this year's delegate assembly, the resolution will be presented in three motions for consideration and a passable, uh, possible amendment. The committee is also recommending a change in KASB's position on the constitutional authority of the Kansas State Board of Education presented on page nine. We'll talk about that in a moment, and that'll be the fourth motion. And then finally, the committee is proposing KASB's address the issues for teachers' professional negotiations and teacher due process by adding new sections to the first in education resolution and amending current KASB policies. These will be the fifth and sixth motion presented on page 10 and 12. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more too of where we're at with that. And again, keep in mind, this is, and I had to step back. It was hard for me a little bit from this standpoint because I went there with what we've talked about and, and how we see things working, especially when we talk about the due process and we talk about the teacher negotiations and how things work here. But then when I get there and look at it a statewide, it's, it's not the same thing. They don't, maybe they don't have as, as a, as smooth a process as what we have. And so when I'm sitting there on our behalf, I, I promise you I've voiced our opinions of what we do here. But it's interesting that, that the Olathe School District has one vote and you've got small districts out in the state of Kansas that have one vote, okay? So it doesn't matter the size from that standpoint. So part of my responsibility, at least what I viewed from that, is saying this is what we saw from the Olathe School District and the things that we do. And so then we had to come up with a resolution because I can tell you that there were some vast differences, some very strong opinions saying this is what we want. Then we had some that said, well, we're okay with where we're at today, which is what basically a stance we were looking at. And yet we had ended up coming to a compromise because we have to look at this from a state standpoint, from that legislative committee. So I just wanted to bring that up because it was, it was very, there were some very strong um, opinions and there were some very um, long debates and discussions about some of these. Um, specifically, we'll talk about those in a minute. So if you go to the document, and I'm gonna zip through some of these very, very quickly, but if you go through the document starting on page four, um, I'm gonna go through one of the, each one of these and these are the different motions and I'm gonna ask for your, um, request your information coming back and where I need to come back and vote for from that standpoint. We'll go through each one of these motions independently. So motion number one, as I mentioned, it's raise standards for success. If you look through this document, there really is not a lot of changes throughout these. Really the only ones that I wanted to kind of spend a little bit time on would be under A2, student expectations. So it really is setting the standards and, and, and what the standards need to be from that standpoint. As I read through the changes on this, basically what it looks like is that it really is giving a state divine minimum, minimum competency of basic academic skills. Plus, adding to this, though, is a locally defined standard of employment, employability, citizen, citizenship, skill, plus post-secondary employment preparation, and that's based on the student's career interest. 
So with this, it's just adding to me what it is, is really saying that we're going to add to the standards and make things a little bit higher than what they have been in the past. Um, but Dr. Barry, you and I talked about this a little bit. One of the things that I want to make sure that we're aware of is, is if we say yes to this, that's going to be putting um, one good thing about it. It puts more local control on that, so we control our, our uh, curriculum and our standards. But it also means that it's going to be um, some additional resources that we have to have, some more additional work that we have to do to be able to set some of those standards. Is that your understanding also? It, it is a little bit, you bet. Uh, but you said it right there, the strength is that it's a local control, and that's a real strength for the Olathe District uh, curriculum development and assessing that curriculum. Is there any questions about that? That one was pretty straightforward, and, and I feel it's going to, I think it's a positive for us. I don't think that there's anything negative we have to look at from that standpoint. The next one then is A3, graduation targets. Um, and really what this is, is really setting some state-wide um, targets. Uh, again, talking with Dr. Barry prior to this, we're already achieving above and beyond this. So, that, so setting these in place is, is not something that's going to uh, negatively affect this. But what it is, it's great to see this, that they're setting standards higher across the entire state and holding the entire state to a higher level of performance. So I think that that's good. Any questions about that one? Okay, good. Um, the last one, um, looking at A5, financial education. Um, the statement here is what, what's changed is we support a program to encourage and support districts in developing personal financial literacy programs based on local needs and capacity. Now again, we had some discussions about this. Again, I like the fact, or, or there was a consensus of the fact that it goes back to, to local control, but the big part of this was saying that we gotta make sure that the state is gonna fund this. And again, it goes back to some additional resources that if this does come through and if it is part of the legislation, um, we will have to, we will definitely ask for the funding, but it means again that we're going to have to do some additional work. So again, but that's not a bad thing. Financial literacy is, is, is very, very important, and I think that that's a great place to be able to get started with that. So is there any questions about that? If you go through, I want to make sure that that's going to be the first motion. And the last part of the first motion where there was any changes, if you go to C3, the assessment to assess student performance, we support implementation and improving testing programs aligned with the Kansas College and Career Ready Standards. So it really is just taking it from that Common Core and, and, and dropping the Common Core um, title to adding in the uh, Kansas College and Career Ready Standards. The important part about this is it also supports for allowing districts to choose different assessments. And again, that goes back to that local control. And that's the thing that we continue to hear um, some of the negativity out there about Common Core is they, they feel like things are being pushed down. But this does give us that opportunity because we choose it. There'll be a, a group of assessments that we could choose from, but we get to choose those assessments from that standpoint. And that's my understanding, correct? And again, keep in mind, this is KASB's uh, preferred stance about assessments where it will actually be up to the State Department of Education. Uh, and so again, that's an ongoing process right now, but, but this is a stance that KESB would like to allow us to have choice. Great. Okay. So that's motion one. Those are the topics with that standpoint. Is there any comments, concerns, questions? Is this something that you feel that we should be able to support? Is this as a yes vote on this for, for the motion one? Okay. Good. See, it's going smooth. It's not going to take till nine o'clock. <laughs> All right. Section two, motion two. Finance for success. If you kind of look down through here again, not a lot of major changes. A um, big part of this is base funding though. And again, we do support that very much and making sure that we are, are getting what the state board request of the, um, let me step back. Adds reference to the state board request, previous legislative <coughs> and judicial decisions, cost studies, comparable state spending, historical levels of support. What this is really kind of referring to, and you'll see that later in this document also, is that KASB is really kind of changing, at least my understanding, and Dr. Berry can correct me on this, is changing their stance on, on moving more in alignment with the State Board of Education, something that they haven't done as much in the past. Um, it was more on the legislative side of it, but now they're seeing more support from the State Board of Education. And you're gonna see some of that, some of that um, discussion throughout this entire document where they're really supporting that a little bit more. And Amy, you could probably talk a little bit um, more about that also. I don't know that it's so much they're moving in line with the State Board of Education so much as that these positions are <clears throat> an attempt to, um, to give the KASB lobbyist information to testify on what comes up during the session. And so some of our positions 
could potentially be 40 years old if they haven't been revisited. You know, we, their education is a compl uh, complicated endeavor. And so one of the things that we saw in the last legislative session was some attempts by the legislature to remove some of the control from the State Board of Education. So I think it was the desire of KASB to maybe strengthen some of our language in regard to uh, the role of the State Board of Education so that uh, Mr. Tallman, who's the lobbyist, could potentially testify in anything that they anticipate will come up next year. Mm -hmm. as, you, as you read through these, you'll see that um, some of the references is add reference to State Board requests. So, and again, that speaks to what Amy is talking about and helping them from that standpoint to be able to give uh, more credence to what we're trying to accomplish from that standpoint. So if you look through the rest of two, there's not a lot of changes from that standpoint. Um, the one where there is a change is on page seven, and that's E1, E and that's talking about the state revenues. What this does do, it adds a statement that if current tax policies do not produce adequate revenue to fund education, those policies should be revised. And that makes just a lot of sense based on the tax changes that have been made is basically KSA, KASB's position is that's great. If everything's going well, that's wonderful. But if it doesn't move in the direction we're looking for, then we need to come back and revise that because we don't want that to affect the state funding for education at that point. Okay. So that's motion two. Any questions, any concerns? Do we support motion two? How do they define um I mean, this is a long discussion, but how do they define adequate education or, or to fund education? That's a pretty broad statement. Yes, and, and, I, and I can tell you that we didn't narrow it down from that standpoint, but basically what it did come back to is, is what is in the Constitution, nation, Constitution of what is that um, funding level or where we need to be at. And basically saying that if, if what the, my understanding and interpretation of this is if the tax revenues continue to go, if they don't go up, if they go down, um, then they can't come back to the state to education and keep taking money away from us just because we're not, the state's not earning that revenue. Is that? It also, it, it's broad enough that it allows the association to have multiple positions depending on what comes up. We currently have a funding formula. It is not fully funded. Uh, funds are prorated to us. So that would allow this statement to say, if, if funding is not there with the current taxing policies, you can change them. We advocate for that. So that, if nothing else, we get the full funding that's supposed to be coming. Okay. So any questions about motion two? You support that? Good. You're making my job easy. All right, number three, talking about local leadership for success. As you can see on page seven, there weren't any changes to that. This is where, but getting into where it is section C and talking about um, employee relations, strengthening board and administrator management flexibility while maintaining core employee rights. All right, so let's jump into that one a little bit because that really does talk about the teacher negotiations and it talks about uh, the teacher due process. And this is obviously, again, this is where the biggest discussions, debates, and, and differences across the districts across the state of Kansas. Um, there were multiple options, and I, we didn't, I know Dr. Berry sent some information out to you uh, earlier in the week sometime where it had all, the appendix, it had all the different options in there. We came up and we discussed, I think, in both of those four different options. And I can tell you in both of those, the, I don't want to say the number one option because I don't want to rank it as being the best or the worst. But the first option that was presented um, from a teacher's negotiation standpoint, and, and again, there was some very strong um, discussions about this um, and some very strong opinions about this, um, especially in, in, in the Western Kansas area, um, was really narrowing that down to basically even just five items on the negotiations. Okay? And then you had other districts, such as the Olathe, that we came in and said, you know what, we've got a good bargaining situation. And so what we had to do from the state side of this, we had to come back and find a, a compromise because we couldn't vote yes for this or no for that. You couldn't vote no for this and yet for, yes for that because it wasn't going to work. There had to be a compromise. So if you look at this um, and really understand where we're at with this, and, and I've sat down and I've read this a lot, and, and I, you know, Again, going back to my first statement of the two things that are the most important for this school district, and actually for all the school districts across the uh, Kansas City or across Kansas, really should be 
about the state funding and making sure that we're able to take care of getting our, our children educated. And then the second piece of that is that, that curriculum, that, that Kansas college and career ready. That's where, honestly, it would be great if everybody would just focus on that. But there are some, there was debate and discussions about this, and so we had to come up and say, okay, how do we walk away with something that's gonna feel good for everybody as much as possible so that we could still focus on the two things that are most important to us? And that's where this proposal came from, because like I said, in the options, when you look at that, you're gonna see that there was an option of, of, of really narrowing that down to nothing. <clears throat> this one here, and I'm gonna just, I wanna read it to you, because I wanna make sure that everybody understands where it's coming from, um, and get an understanding from this standpoint. So this is the employee relations, strengthen the board and administrator management flexibility while maintaining core employee rights, professional negotiations. We support continuation of collective bargaining between school boards and teacher associations. I do want to bring up that this, pro this proposal will specifically recognize that right, okay? We believe changes sh should be made in the Professional Negotiations Act to strengthen professionalism and efficient district operations, which we would seek to achieve through negoti negotiations and teacher representation. If agreements are reached that are acceptable to KASB Board of Directors, KASB will oppose further amendments to the uh, Professional Neg Negotiations Act. So reading through this, and, and, and Dr. Berry, help me if, if, I, if my interpretation is not completely clear on this. What this is telling me is that we have the opportunity to negotiate, negotiate the way that we want to, but it also gives, and as long as we come to an agreement um, with the teachers association, but it also gives these districts that, that want to narrow things down, more power to narrow them down in the districts where they're at, okay? So help me, is that your, it, I think it's a flexibility on both sides. It, yeah. It's not saying we want to take everything away, and it's not saying that we that you try to give everything away. It's saying let's get back to the point where we're able to negotiate this and really talk about this and come to an agreement going forward. I think there's always been, uh, obviously, the permissibly negotiable list so that districts can do more if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, what I think this also specifically is calling out is that, you know, when during the session last year when some of this was brought up and it became quite contentious, someone said, wait a minute, let's step back, let's get these groups together and see if we can work something out uh, and be brought forward. And I think that's what this language is also saying will happen is that that uh, the groups will get together and I think that meeting has been scheduled and uh, if they can work something out, then, then the KESB's position would say, let's leave Professional Negotiations Act alone. We'd be okay with it. Yes. Amy, do you have anything to, to add? Well, again, it, it goes back to anticipating what kind of legislation we can expect and being prepared and coming up with a position that leaves KASB um, in a position that, that they can find this common ground that exists across the state and, and across varying districts. And, and this is a, a compromise that the committee reached. And I would add that um, especially on the board of directors, we're kind of all over the place. Some, some school districts feel very strongly that they need more flexibility, and other districts are okay with what they have now. And, and there's kind of a general agreement, too, that education, public education in Kansas um, is up against, you know, we're, we're walking an uphill path right now with the legislature. There doesn't seem to be support where we would like to see it in a lot of areas, and that, um, that we're the ones who should be working together to improve public education. And the best way to do that is, is to get together and talk about these things and meet. Any other comments, questions? So looking at that statement, again, because that will be motion, that one will be no, uh, motion number five, um, is this something that we're willing to support? The way that this is, the way that this is worded. It's something I can support. Uh, just um, a comment. Having been at the, the, the delegate assembly in the past, um, this is going to be a really contentious issue at the delegate assembly. And as Ms. Martin talked about compromise, and there may be some districts who are not interested in this type of language, so it's going to come down to a, to a final paddle vote. And we vote with, you vote with paddles, so. Well, it, it uh, comes down to a final paddle vote, but hopefully the people who are representing the smaller school districts 
um, are taking this back to the districts they represent. Yeah, it's important to remember that the Olathe School District, we, we have one representative at the legislative committee meetings and one member on the, on the board of directors. Some of these smaller districts, they're combined into these areas where they might, I don't know, have 30 or 40 school districts represented by one person. So it's, it's upon that person to take the information back and, and try to earn the votes of their delegates. So it's kind of hard to know But But at the delegate assembly, every school district has one vote. Exactly. Regardless exactly. of what, what information they got from their uh, board representative. So it right. will be interesting to see what the outcome of this becomes mm -hmm. is. And that's and, and again, so we in our, in our legislative committee, we we had that discussion, and and to try to find that compromise, okay, w w was very important because again, there were some very strong, boisterous people that really wanted to <laughs> tie things down, and and what we wanted to make sure is that we didn't walk away and say we needed to find a compromise to that because we didn't want to walk away and say this is where we want to be at, and 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 I and like I said, I could tell you that that I was. We talked a lot about that, and and sure. we didn't want to change substantially the things that we're doing now because we I feel that we've got I think we work very very well, and and I want to be able to continue it from that standpoint. And that'd be great if we could, if all we had to do is worry about Olathe, that would be great. But we don't in this situation we don't get that luxury. We we need to find something that we're going to be able to help other people see it in the same way and give them some flexibility. Why at the same time we continue to do it in the way that we want to be able to uh, move forward. With. And that's, yeah. and we hope other other school boards are taking that same broad view, but we don't get to control that. Right, but mm -hmm. I can tell you, not all of them look at it that way. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. All right, teachers. Uh, so, so back to that that motion. Is that one that we're comfortable with? And that if I, when I get down there, I can vote yes on this one. Okay. All right, due process. Um, and I'm going to read this off the top also, just so that we can kind of get some supporting behind it. Committee believes KASB members support changes to make it easier um, to remove teachers who are not performing at satisfactory levels. However, concerns are expressed about having the board conduct the hearing. This proposal would continue to allow the teacher to having a hearing be, um, before an independent officer, but it would change the standard of evidence required by the school board from substantial evidence to preponderance of evidence. This is, this is accomplished, if this is accomplished, KSA, KASB would oppose further changes in the law and drop its support for a new trial on appeal. Um, so again, this goes back to Part A, employee relations, strengthen board administrative uh, management flexibility while maintaining core employee rights. How it's gonna read out, due process. We support the current system of due process rights for teachers if the process is clarified to allow Board of Education to remove teachers as long as such removal is supported by a preponderance of evidence. The Board's decision should give um, deference unless its action was arbitrary, capricious, or unsupported by evidence. Now, I talked to Dr. Berry. Did you happen to pull up that <laughs> the, the definition of preponderance? I did. I scribbled okay. it down here. But we could also put Scott Mason on, on the hot spot if we wanted to, too, but I won't do that. Um, preponderance, uh, the majority, the mass, the bulk. So the bulk of the evidence, the majority of the evidence has to be uh, it, it one way or the other in order to get that decision, as opposed to substantial, ample, or considerable amount. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be funny about it, but it's clear as mud. Yeah, right? exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, and, 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 and I don't want to make light of it, but, that, but again, this goes back to the fact that there were some very strong, boisterous um, districts out there that wanted this, number one, to take away the, uh, the independent officer part of this. They also wanted it to be very board driven um, and, and making all the final decisions. And so this was that compromise of saying, okay, we, we, we don't want to go to this extreme but we need to have a little bit here to be able to get some of the people that are very boisterous off of the, off the ledge, but also is off the ledge from that standpoint to say, okay, we agree upon this. Um, so again, I, I see this as a good compromise. I see this as an opportunity, again, um, to be able to continue in the same fashion of what we're doing here in Olathe. And I think we, you know, Dr. Berry, I think you would agree with us is that, you know, these are some situations that rarely do we ever even run into some of these issues, but this gives us the opportunity to be able to work and walk and talk things, um, through this in a, um, basically in the same procedures that we're doing it now, just the level of evidence from the definition is a little bit different. Any questions? Any comments? Well, it's hard to, uh, 
when you when you read this and you reflect well i reflect on i guess what am i in my 13th year on the board thinking about <clears throat> the strong professional development and the strong supports that we have for, for teachers in our district, teachers who are in, in, in need of, of additional support, that we don't move to this level without having expended great efforts, you know, that there are no due process hearings. So it's hard to, to hear that other districts are rabidly, excitedly, wanting to have that kind of, of wording. So, you know, I, I inject a note of caution, but I, it, it appears to be, it appears to be a compromise across the state. I doubt that it affects us much here. No, and I, and I agree with that. And that's why, again, bringing this back, all of these different topics, you know, it was easy for me to sit here in front of the board and talk and say, here are the things that I think, I think this makes sense, okay? Um, we, had, we actually had to have, our, had the opportunity <laughs> to put our voice out there. I don't see it, to Dr. Daniels' um, point, I don't see it really changing how we operate for the most part. Um, my concern is, is and, and, and this is why I wanted to bring this up, if we came back and we said no, 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 no to all of this, my concern is, if we're saying no to this, in some eyes, in some respect, we're saying yes to the very extremes. And that's what I was more concerned about from that standpoint of saying, okay, let's, you know, we've got people here, we've got people here. What I don't want to do is go this far. I really don't. I don't think that's the Olathe way, and I don't think that that would make us feel good about if we went to some extremes of what some of these things were presented. And you'll have, you can read the options, and some of these were very extreme. This gives us that opportunity to say, okay, let's continue to operate in the manner of which we are. There's going to be some changes from that standpoint. But I, I want to make sure that we're giving our voice out there that we do operate in a very sound, very um, collaborative type of manner and, and want to be able to continue to do that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So for both these motion uh, five and motion six, is this something that you're comfortable with me going down and saying yes in, in the way it's written? But... <laughs> Mr. Parker's standpoint, and I've not had a chance to be there yet, so it'll be interesting to see how it all works. Um, if it goes, if it goes, if it's <coughs> voted as written, we're comfortable with all of these. Is that what we're saying? Do we? Have, we don't have to take a vote. This is kind of like a straw poll right, type it's of a deal. Straw okay. Poll. Okay. Dr. Berry, did I miss anything? You covered it very well. Okay. And, and again, as has been said several times, the interesting part is once people stand up and start to make amendments and the language changes and it'll be interesting. Yeah. I just, I'd like to thank Rick yes. for the time yes. and the attention he's, and you know, the thought that he's put into this because these are, they're kind of difficult discussions. I don't know if you guys catch that, but we, we value our relationship with our teachers association and with our teachers as individuals and we aren't anxious to do anything to jeopardize that. However, um, we have to look for solutions at a time when um, there there are larger picture things to consider, and so so we are hopeful that everyone can understand um, why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. My only comment would be, Rick, um, if things move toward an extreme and you feel uncomfortable, then I would hope our board would support you in saying we're not interested in supporting a, an extreme right. statement. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Appreciate that. <laughs> nice job, Rick. Great. That's good. <laughs> Dr. Barry, you're on. Just a few comments. Um, a personal comment. I got home late last night from a meeting out in Salina, Kansas. I got a call this morning at four something from our meteorology uh, meteorologist service, so telling me that to be careful there was potentially some frost on the sidewalks this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I guess all it, in my groggy state this morning, I, I was uh, good enough at least that I did not call school off for that. <laughs> um, but it did signal that we are in that season now. And so uh, that is something this district's always had a service that we get a personal phone call to give us the latest on the weather. But I've never had one that said, be careful about the frost on the sidewalks this morning. Uh, kind of breaking news, uh, something we'll be releasing, but the Burns and McDonald Battle of the Brains 
uh, from which one of our schools uh, won the competition in recent years. Uh, they have named the top 10 finalists, the schools that are in the running, and we have two of those finalists, a uh, team from Olathe East and a team from Olathe North. So it will uh, be exciting how that plays out. Uh, and again, a great contest. Uh, we talked just a little bit earlier about um, the testing decision and the KSB position that says we sure like to have lots of uh, choice. Uh, this is something that is continuing to unfold at the State Department and in a meeting that I was at yesterday, uh, a little bit of clarification that the recommendation to the State Board for grades three through eight is gonna be the smarter balance test. And so that's something that we would have to take. There will be some options, it looks like, at the high school level, and that can be on a student by student basis. Uh, so anyway, we'll see how that plays out. And again, there's some funding issues that will come with that in terms of having the money to have those new tests. Um, quick, quick update, just very quick. And, and um, uh, Brent asked about uh, Mill Creek and the other buildings we want to talk about as well. The tech support building that Rita uh, talks about being so excited about continues to go up. It was nice to hear a lot of banging today, which means they're back on. We had a little bit of an issue with some of the steel being delivered and we're behind slightly. But the really great thing about that, number one, it's gonna be a wonderful building. But number two, we're not putting kids in that, obviously. We don't have to open it a certain day with kids, but we still are looking at a mid-spring, mid maybe a, a completion on that one. Food Production Center, uh, we continue to tear it apart before we make it look better. And again, not to ever be critical of the past, but, but we've discovered a lot of um, uh, issues in the construction of that building, so we are really protecting the investment of that building for a long time into the future. Uh, cracking the foundation, failing bricks, and so forth, and we're taking care of that. Uh, adding the space that we've never had. All the growth in our district, we've never enlarged that food production center like we add schools on, uh, and that building was built in 1990, I think. Um, elementary number 35, you saw some pictures. Again, a lot of excitement for that to come up. And then the other piece that, that we're getting very excited about is we are now starting to formally meet to talk about the design of high school number five. Uh, and again, we're just at the visioning concept level. We have an, a small team that's gonna grow bigger. Um, and, and again, the, the work that we've already seen from the architectural firms that are working with us, we're really pleased and we think you will be as well. Um, we had a great uh, presentation, I thought, uh, uh, good comments from Kaylin and staff about American Education Week, and I just want to uh, echo those, that really the strength of the Olathe District that we can celebrate this month is our instructional staff, our principals, our support staff, everybody that works in this district. We really have um, tre tremendous support to educate our kids. Um, quick little story that I saw tonight, I have the viewpoint of being able to see through that door during the early part of the meeting, and they were doing the elementary art exhibit. And I saw a little guy walk by slowly, uh, had to be about a first grader, um, so he's here to, to look at his art. He had a suit on, mm -hmm. and not only was his family with him, but grandma, I could tell, was following along. Mm -hmm. So what a neat experience for a first grader to come and show his art to his family and that he dressed up in a suit. I mean, it's part of the big picture that we're able to do here in the Olathe District, and it's exciting to be able to, to celebrate that a little bit. I also wanna brag on staff, and I'm gonna embarrass somebody because it's a single story, uh, but it's a story about um, Rita Lyon. A teacher wrote me just recently and said, I wanna let you know how much I appreciate working in a district as wonderful and helpful as this. I think if I were working outside education in this district, I would not have received the help I needed. We've been working on the Plasco Track software program that tracks student tardies at Olathe South and struggling to load student pictures. Rita Lyon found out we were frustrated and emailed me to offer her help. I had not even contacted her or anybody about this help. Once she saw the problem, she quickly figured out the solution and walked me through it. We've successfully loaded the pictures into the database. I just wanted to let you know personally how much I appreciate Rita Lyon and her unwavering dedication to our district and its staff. Without her help, I would have been floundering. So again, I could give you example after example that again, she wasn't even contacted, but she heard somebody was frustrated, reached out to help. And uh, we see that so much in, in the Olathe District and that's why it's so much fun to come to work and, and uh, help kids. I will close then that I would like to ask, um, I'm not gonna have an executive session tonight, not asking for one, but maybe we could trade that for a special meeting uh, November 19th. Uh, if it works, we have the opportunity with the architectural firms in town, including SHW, to come spend just a short amount of time with the Board of Education to talk about what does a high school uh, of the future look like, and, and our future being 2017 or 2018. Um, a lot of the concepts that we, again, no decision-making, not a long night where we 
we uh, you know had to spend a lot of time on things. It's just a chance to hear um, some of the possibilities in terms of concepts. Nineteenth. Nineteenth. The nineteenth. What time? Well, that would be up to you, and I'd be willing to make that even early if you wanted to have a a sandwich or something as soon as you got off work, and we could we could get you home at a decent time where you'd still have some evening. But it's, that's up to you. I, I can be flexible that evening. Five thirty. I'm sorry. What did you say? Five thirty. Five thirty. By me. What did you say? Five thirty is fine. I, I need it after four o'clock if yeah. I was going to make it. Mike needs five thirty. That worked. Five thirty works. That's great. Uh, we'll uh, be efficient with your time. I think you'll enjoy uh, some of what you'll hear. A uh, little bit of discussion. So we'll look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to make one comment. In all the talk, Dr. Barry, about the excitement of. Uh, High school number five, he keeps it upbeat in the fact that he's never mentioned once the term boundary. <laughs> <laughs> we do those well in Olathe, and we'll just take that on when it comes. No executive session, then I believe we are adjourned. <clears throat>